Hello everyone, and welcome to the Dry Dock episode 236. This is, of course, the end of the month Patreon Dry Dock, and, well, I'm still overcoming the effects of jet lag, so if I sound a little bit loopy at points, uh, that's probably why. Nonetheless, let's get on with questions. Adam Schindler asks... You commented upon the transition from wood to iron in the late Napoleonic Wars era Royal Navy frigates as a function of a lack of suitable lumber. I'm aware of fragmentary evidence of Britain and the US realising the importance of certain trees for masts, keels and scantlings in the late 19th century, but is there any evidence of planning or broad strategic thinking in terms of securing specific lumber to sustain a navy? Yes, there is plenty of evidence of people planning in very broad terms to secure lumber for their navies. It varies country by country. In Britain, for example, and bear in mind at this point they also controlled the whole of Ireland, there had always been extensive forests. There's considerably less forestry now in the UK than there used to be. And whilst sort of the the pop culture idea that the Royal Navy just stripped entire landscapes bare of trees is not accurate, apart from anything else, the vast majority of trees in a typical British forest are not suitable for warship construction. Uh, They did rather denude British forests of the trees that were suitable for construction, mostly the really large oaks and elms. Now, the problem with that is that because there was so much forest, they had kind of assumed that there always would be timber and whilst there were some controlled forests where the admiralty would try and grow specific trees it wasn't particularly common and of course it takes decades or centuries for trees to grow to the appropriate sizes for warship construction in the age of sail and so just because you might have a particular grove or wood that had been seeded by the Admiralty and was protected by it, that didn't necessarily mean it would be of any use to you in a particular conflict, because in order for a specific growth of trees to be ready and useful, that would have required someone, you know, 100, 200, 300 years ago to anticipate the need for vast amounts of timber that many centuries ahead of time, which isn't really possible. In other countries, though, with smaller navies and or less forests, it was possible to anticipate the need for specific types of timber. And so it's more common in those areas to find forests that were planted at fairly regular intervals and were marked for use in warships. In fact, there are still a number of forests that are maturing today that have been marked for those purposes centuries ago when the age of sail was a thing and some of them are still actually used there i believe there is a forest in the u.s that's specifically earmarked to provide timbers for the upkeep of uss constitution for example whereas for somewhere like britain although as i said there was some limited attempts by the admiralty to control and preserve certain types of timber growth when they realized they were going through britain's ship timbers at a rate that was pretty unsustainable they ended up forming a very large network of overseas trade with other areas which had exploitable timber resources which they then very viciously defended Uh, one of the biggest items of fallout for example from the 13 colonies going independent was that they had actually supplied a good chunk of ship timber especially mast timber for the royal navy and obviously with them now becoming independent that was going to be somewhat harder which is one of the reasons why after a decade or two of understandable tension the british were relatively speaking willing to reignite trade with what was now the usa because well it might be a bit more of a premium price but hopefully it was still a good source of timber Um, and in response to the loss of the american colonies they intensified another element of trade that they built up which was with the baltic regions and so when you look at nelson's attack on copenhagen for example that's almost entirely driven by the british need to secure the baltic trade for ship timber and other elements of uh, ship parts of tar and uh, ropes and so forth if they hadn't had to trade with sweden primarily um for all of these components 
then it's relatively unlikely they would have bothered to go after the Danes in quite the way that they did. But as far as the Royal Navy was concerned, especially when they're at war, that supply route absolutely had to remain open at all costs. And then, of course, as you indicated with your question, when you get to frigates like HMS Unicorn here, by this stage, Britain is running short, even with these overseas supplies, of timbers of a suitable size and length that they go to a mixture of cross bracing with the Seppings and Simmons systems, which allows you to maintain the strength of a hull using shorter timbers, uh, which also means you can use up stocks of timber that you previously wouldn't been able to utilize, and iron cross strapping. And then, of course, with when those work in combination over the next couple of decades, it turns out you can use cross bracing and iron strapping to expand the size of wooden warships as well, which is kind of a a little bit of a happy accident of an effort that originally came out of a way of just avoiding problems with lack of large ship timber. Matt Blom asks, During a large battle such as Jutland, did the top-ranking admirals such as Sheer and Jellicoe directly signal minor forces such as the destroyer flotillas and cruisers with orders? If so, how were flags destined for destroyers or cruisers differentiated from the signals to the capital ships in the fleet? Or, in other words, how did the command structure filter down from capital ships to cruisers and then destroyers? It was a bit of a combination system. So you can issue flag orders to specific units by using specific designators with your flag signal. So if, let's say, using a fairly generic one, if you want to order a formation to turn 10 degrees to starboard, you can add qualifier flags that will specify a ship or a formation. And obviously those specific qualifier flags, you can either spell out the particular formation or you can have a prearranged set of signals for that particular fleet so, um, in order to say, you know, this flag at the beginning means that the orders are going to this particular unit and everybody knows what their designator unit or designator flag is. And this is basically the same system that goes all the way back to the Age of Sail. Um, so in a battle like Trafalgar, it, it was possible to signal the fleet generally, but it was also possible to signal individual ships by, again, using some kind of qualifier, whether prearranged or spelt out, to talk to a specific vessel, even though other people could see the flags. However, at Jutland, it was more common, partly because of the visibility caused by the mist, as you can see here, and partly also just to avoid general confusion and to make sure people knew what was going on, it was more common to actually use radio. So you could signal a particular unit's flagship by radio and ask them to do something, and then they would give the orders to the, their subordinates. You could also use signal lights as well, which are obviously a bit more directional, and a whole combination of these things would be used throughout the battle. And so you can find records of Jellico, for example, sending queries or orders to some of the light cruiser squadrons by sending a signal via radio, as I said, to the flagship. And then if they weren't in a position to respond to his query or request immediately, then, or it was an order to maneuver, then that flagship would then relay the signal or orders in order to affect that signal to its compatriot vessels. Bill Brockman asks, if the 40mm Bofors hadn't been available for whatever reason, could the 1.1-inch Chicago piano anti-aircraft system have been improved into an adequate defensive weapon? Or would the US Navy have just bought British pom-poms? In theory, it would have been possible to gradually update the 1.1-inch to a point where it could have been a relatively viable anti-aircraft weapon however there would be a number of problems with that firstly it would take some time to get the thing to full reliability and that would complicate production because as you're changing things to make it more reliable you're also going to have to change things on the production line and modify newly produced units to that standard and secondly it is still only a 28 millimeter weapon so it would occupy this slightly odd position of not having the world's greatest prolonged rate of fire and also not having the world's greatest hitting power 
or range compared to a 40mm weapon of some description, whilst also being close enough to the Orlikon 20mm that it would be kind of competing on that level as well. Whereas, as I've mentioned before, the US was looking into already a 40mm anti-aircraft weapon and had this competition going between the Bofors 40mm and the Pompom, wherein the Pompom came remarkably close in second place. Uh, it wasn't written off completely. So I think if the 40mm Bofors hadn't been available, then it is far more likely that the pom-pom would have been brought in by the USA as a replacement for the 1.1 inch rather than continuing to try and fix the 1.1 inch. Um, and bearing in mind that the Bofors 40mm, once it had secured its place as the winner, had to be basically stripped down and essentially redesigned for mass production in the US, I don't think that you would necessarily have exactly the same pom-poms as you had in the Royal Navy. Bear in mind the Royal Navy was chucking pom-poms out there onto ships as fast as possible because they're in the middle of a war. Um, the US, although at this stage also kind of pretty much at the beginning of their direct involvement in the war, had a little bit more of a, rem a remote distance to work with. So I think like with the Bofors, they probably would have taken the pom-pom into hand and seen what they could do to improve it, either performance-wise or in terms of ease of production. And then that would have gone on. And bear in mind that the weight of a quadruple pom-pom, um, so this is a quad 1.1 inch on North Carolina, but a quad pom-pom, its mounting is actually slightly less heavy than the mounting for a typical quad 40 millimeter Bofors. Uh, the octuple is heavier but the octuple is only 50 percent heavier than the quad mounting and of course doubles the number of gun barrels and that's for the remote power control variants which are somewhat heavier than the more standard variants you have at the beginning of the war so yes it's entirely possible that uh, much as you see plenty of u.s ships smothered in 40 millimeter bofors towards the end of the war you might well have seen American ships with some modified version of a pom-pom in this scenario covered in just as many guns, although, as I say, given the relative balance of barrels to weight and the American predilection for as many anti-aircraft guns as possible, I suspect that a good number of the quad installations might, in this scenario, have actually been octuple pom-pom installations, which would have presented a hilarious amount of firepower for the kamikazes to try and get through. The Rogue Chief asks... Why, during World War II, did German shipwrecks tend to have broken off sterns, whilst Japanese and American shipwrecks tend to have broken off bows? Was it a matter of building techniques, materials, alignment of the cosmos, uh, or something else? Now, obviously, it doesn't happen to every wreck, or ships that were damaged, like Minneapolis in this case, but generally speaking, the loss of the bows tends to be on ships that have some variant of the all-or-nothing armor protection scheme or structure that is very similar to that. It's especially prevalent on cruisers and other high-speed vessels, um, some destroyers if they're lucky enough to survive at all, because they, as a necessity of having to go pretty quickly, tend to have very fine bows. And then when you reach usually the forward gun battery and occasionally the next gun further back depending on where the hit has become you end up with a situation where you have a relatively lightly built bow structure which then runs into a very stiff portion of the ship because you've got the armor both in terms of belt armor and then deck armor and bulkheads as well plus the sheer mass of a gun installation, whether that be a gun mounting and its feed system or a full-on turret and barbette in something like a cruiser or larger. And so when a ship takes damage, this creates a natural concentration of stress, therefore a natural shear point. And so if you do get hit in the bow, it's very likely that your bow will then fail, if it's going to fail at all, at this juncture. And as I said, sometimes you get cases where the front turret falls off and that's because then there's a secondary juncture point of stress where the second gun installation is. And 
with both Japanese and American ships, which are mostly centered around the all or nothing principle. This kind of thing happens when they get hit in the bows. As I said, it does happen to destroyers as well. Now, obviously, destroyers don't usually carry armor, but their machinery spaces and gun installations do tend to form this kind of more central, stiffer portion of the vessel, so they can be vulnerable to losing their bows as well, like HMS Eskimo did repeatedly. Now, when you get to the stern, for somewhat similar reasons, it's entirely possible for a Japanese or an American ship to lose its stern if it gets hit, but... If you look at an overhead profile of, let's say, a cruiser, because this seems to be the things that it most often happens to, you can usually see the stern is somewhat fuller going aft than the finer lines of the bow, and therefore it, the, the structure has a little bit more rigidity, so it's slightly less and slightly more mass to it, so it's slightly less likely to fail in the event of similar damage. When it comes to the German ships, however... Um, a lot of German ships are much beloved of the triple screw propulsion system. And as a result of the way their armor scheme is laid out, you end up with usually some kind of armored box over the steering compartment. Now, that's relatively common across most ships. But with that triple screw set up with a center screw causing the stern to rise a lot more quickly underwater than a quadruple or twin screw arrangement does it means that you end up with a fairly rigid box in a relatively shallow stern structure, which again sort of doubles up on creating a shear point and then there's the gap in the armor protection, so that part of the ship is a bit more flexible. And so you have a weaker, less massive stern with a significant degree of rigidity, which then causes a shear point as it starts to deepen out and then you have sterns collapsing a lot. Uh, so that's a German design issue. Um, there is also questions about you know weld strength, the appropriate materials used, um, weld types. There's some indications of failing welds as well on some German ships. Um, so it is a whole combination of factors, but from an underlying engineering perspective, the triple propulsion system, triple screw propulsion system it does have something to answer for in these cases. Ryan Frederick asks, I recently saw a photo floating around the internet of the officer's wardroom on HMS Inflexible. I have to say it looks a rather posh with a fireplace, nice furniture, patterned carpet. If you gave it some oak panelling and it might have come off of the Titanic or some other ocean liner. Can you tell us more about luxuries on warships? A lot of the luxuries like the wardroom you mentioned and like in this photo here are, you know, reminiscent of the age of sail you know, if you go on something like USS Constitution or the Constellation in the States or Victory, Trincomalee etc in the UK obviously those were wooden ships so the wood panelling etc etc was all you know to a certain degree part of the ship and so was the furniture as time went on however and ships became iron and steel well you know, iron and steel benches are not necessarily the most comfortable things, so the officers liked to retain accents of that older, slightly more comfortable era by decorating the wardrooms as such. Now, that tended to be mostly a peacetime thing, as you'll have seen more recently with a uh, video about USS Marblehead. Uh, when it comes time for war, a lot of these features are stripped out and removed because they are splinter and fire hazards if the ship gets hit. Uh, some of the chairs might hang around, maybe a table or two, uh, but most of the wooden furniture, the panelling, etc. goes by the way. And over the 20th century, this, to a certain degree, evolved into a lot of the furniture and fittings gradually becoming more and more suitable to be retained on board for wartime because it meant less disruption although if you do get a chance to visit an officer's wardroom on an active warship these days depending to a certain degree on the navy you'll still notice there are certain luxury fittings um, which are above and beyond what you might find in the regular mess now as for other kind of quality of life amenities that you might find on a warship um, the Petty officer, or basically NCOs, wardroom, whatever you want to call them in your various navies, 
like chief master chiefs uh, etc in the u.s navy um they also will tend to have their own luxuries but very much more to their own tastes and the crew will also try to usually enhance their living spaces in whatever way they can that they're allowed to obviously by the officers and back in the time period the channel covers that might include pets and so forth but once again an awful lot of this stuff would have to go by the board when it comes time to preparing the vessel for war you can also have again depending on the navy other installations such as ice cream makers in the u.s navy and depending on the ship certain other provisions again mostly peacetime things uh, such as swimming pools in old gun mountings as well as libraries which often again would be stocked by the captain or other senior officers and later on certain entertainments which could eventually include films or even simple adaptations of technologies that were available for other purposes such as there are several records in the late 19th century of ships that were moored in relatively shallow waters in shall we say the more warmer areas of the planet such as the Mediterranean where the captains of the ships would consent to deploy their torpedo nets which remember at that point they were carrying around on booms not because they thought there was going to be any particular risk of torpedo attack being that it was a peaceable time but simply because if you put a bunch of torpedo nets around your ship in around the circumference of the vessel in shallow water you'd effectively created a shark proof swimming environment for the crew matt kidd asks the iowas were designed to counter the congos what was the u.s navy's plan to deal with the congos before the iowas were put into service it it depends very much on what time period you're looking at because you've got to bear in mind that the congos were of one set of capabilities before their major modernizations and upgrades in the mid-1930s and in terms of why exactly the iowas particularly their speed was upgraded during that period so when you look at the congos in their initial form when the u.s was worried about facing off against them so late 1910s early 1920s initially that would they would have been dealt with with the lexingtons then of course the lexingtons weren't allowed by the treaty at least in as battle cruisers and in the interwar period it was initially well they'd have to come and fight the u.s battle line because the u.s battle line was coming to them and at least until the latter part of the 1920s there weren't any fast carriers to worry about the congos intercepting between the late 1920s and the mid 1930s the plan was partially again overwhelming u.s military might would force the congos to join up with the japanese battle line and hopefully that would keep them away from the carriers plus if you in theory the thinking went if you put enough heavy cruisers in escort around the carriers then they could either hold off the battle cruisers long enough for the carrier to make an escape or for the carrier's aircraft to do something or both um, but then in the mid-1930s you have a very narrow window where having a fast battleship or two like the north carolinas would be able to roughly match the speed of the congos and obviously massively overpower them in terms of protection and firepower but then as the Congos go in and come out of refit and it they're now faster again that's kind of when you run into the issue of well amongst other reasons let's build the Iowa class so there are various phases on how the U.S. plans to deal with the Congos but by the time the Congos are as a whole class capable of you know 30 plus knots and the U.S. has enough carriers to worry about things they're already well underway into planning for the Iowas. Glenn Riccafrente asks, Hood and the two Renowns were much faster than contemporary battle cruisers. What were the reasons dash rationale for the jump in speed? The two set classes have similar but separate rationales for their high speed. Uh, when it comes to the Renowns, which were designed and laid down slightly earlier, it's simply fisher taking advantage of the fact that battleship construction has been suspended and the fact that 
as you probably guessed from the videos we've done on Fisher, he's always wanting to move things forward. So the Invincibles had started off the battlecruiser trend with speeds just over 25 knots and partly in response to German capabilities and partly in just because, you know, every escalating ship has to be better that had gradually drifted until you know tiger was closer to 30 knots than 25 knots and so when presented with an opportunity to do not quite a clean slate but you know after a short pause in battle cruise construction fisher was just pressing for them to be as fast as possible and logically you might think well maybe you should aim for about 30 knots but fisher was at that point thinking about well you know the counter to the counter of the counter and that the Germans might be pushing for something in the 28, 29 knot region and therefore having a margin of superiority would be desirable. With Hood, or more overall the Admiral class, that was specifically in response to intelligence the British had received about the Mackensen class. It was somewhat erroneous in that they thought the Mackensons were going to be armed with around about 15 inch guns and that they should be capable of about 30 knots. Again, they were going to be slightly slower and slightly less heavily armed than that. But, nonetheless, the British decided that if that's what the Germans were building, then they were going to have to build something that was considerably more powerful. And that started down the final road of design for the Admiral class, where you, again, added a couple of knots of speed, and in this case matched the theoretical armament. Although, thanks to building to counter a design that was actually a bit more capable than what the Germans were actually building, if you compare the Admirals with the Mackensons, the Admirals are considerably more powerful in all aspects. Although, that should be expected, considering the Admirals are more than 10,000 tons heavier than the Mackensons. Patrick Donnelly asks, What was the material condition of USS Enterprise by the end of World War II? as she'd just come out of a repair overhaul after the Japanese surrender, but a lot of what I've been he hearing is that she was like war spite in being something of a floating wreck. So she was fresh out of overhaul, so she was in materially better condition than war spite at the end of the war, bearing in mind that thanks to the Fritz X hit and various mine hits and so forth, war spite was down a turret and um, a little bit down in speed by the end of World War Two. But it's kind of a six of one half dozen of the other when it comes to Enterprise's condition. As I said, she has just come out of a fairly extensive overhaul, uh, so a lot of her systems have been renewed, updated, repaired, etc, etc. However, the flip side to it is that she has been under repair and renovation quite a lot, thanks to quite a lot of wartime damage. So, uh, from an exterior view, you know, she's ready to go. On the other hand, she is made up of a lot of patchworks, a lot of repairs, a lot of replacements. Um, some of those very well integrated and almost, you know, almost unidentifiable. Others somewhat more obvious. But within the ship itself, you know, the machinery is going to be somewhat worn. You're going to have slight distortions to major portions of the hull and framing as a result of battle damage that don't materially affect her capability to perform her duty um, as such, but they are still ongoing structural issues. So, you know, they'll have a, like a percentage point or two effect on her performance and also will, you know, result in things like leaks and deterioration occurring somewhat faster. Plus there'll be small things like, you know, the odd shrapnel hole or, frame distortion or whatever that the shipyard either can't fix or wouldn't have fixed because it wasn't deemed particularly important. I think the best analogy would be literally a battle-scarred veteran. So, you know, after a particular veteran in a, you know, an old school medieval battle has had time to heal up from his latest wounds, he's been patched up, he's been treated, um, he's had a bit of time to get his conditioning back into shape, so he's still a very lethal and effective fighter, but, you know, just occasionally you might notice a slight twinge in the leg that causes a, a slight limp for a pace or two, you know, scars all over the place, maybe a, a finger missing the here or there, um, that kind of thing, um, you know, knees ache when the weather gets cold, 
that's basically the kind of condition Enterprise was in. She was overall ready to go and would give a fairly good accounting of herself in any subsequent engagement, but there were a fair number of underlying scars and injuries which apart from the fact she was also much smaller than the uh, S6 class that were very prevalent at the time meant that she wouldn't last as long if she went back into active service before she needed another major refit as compared to some of the other carriers. Prime Mark 359 asks at the end of my question on Tiny Tim's you mentioned a magazine fed twin launcher of these rockets for surface ships could you please go into further detail on this? So here's a clip showing the launcher in action, at least as per 1946 testing ranges. Uh, it looks pretty impressive, as you can tell. I would not like to be on the receiving end of that thing. However, that's pretty much all I could find on the matter. Um, whatever other vague references there are don't seem to indicate that it was ever mounted operationally. And I think I can see why. Um, in the further detail of the question, Primark 3509 asks, the rate of fire seems to be their only advantage compared to a normal gun. Um, yes, to a certain degree. Obviously, their rate of fire is a little bit higher. There's also the fact that as a rocket, i.e. a self-propelling weapon, you can mount what is a fairly substantial amount of firepower on a relatively small vessel. But I think this is where the, the problem comes in, which is that with what's effectively a straight line rocket launcher i.e. doesn't have any particular guidance if you're mounting it on a ship that's large enough that the ship is stable enough that when you aim you're going to hit something and bearing in mind the tiny tim is going to have a shorter range than a conventional six or eight inch gun then well you might as well have a six or eight inch or five inch gun because you'll be able to reach out further um, whereas on a smaller vessel where you can't fit such a gun but you want the firepower without any kind of guidance system it's going to be incredibly difficult to aim the thing um you know the, your theoretical pt boat mtb mgb whatever fast attack craft is going to be bouncing up and down all over the place so you risk just you know flinging rockets out into the ether unless you're relatively slow and stationary in calm seas which kind of obviates the point of being a small fast attack craft so as impressive as it looks I would suspect that's probably why it didn't go anywhere. Um, and as I said, you know, the existence of this little bit of film clip is <laughs> the single most substantial part you can point to in terms of evidence for the thing's development. Ferris asks, During her career, the Megami managed to torpedo several troop ships belonging to her own side, if we assume that the Japanese army doesn't count as a hostile force to the Japanese navy, and, through her collision with her sister ship Nakuma, was arguably responsible for the latter ship's loss. It seems she was just as hazardous to her own side as she was to her actual opponents. Are there any other examples of ships with a similar track record? And if so, how bad were they? I'm not aware of a ship in the time period with quite the record of Megami when it comes to directly or indirectly ensuring the sinking of ships on her own side. But there are a number of other ships that were something of a menace to their own side. Um, ironically enough, HMS Warspite in World War One and the interwar period had something of a reputation for taking chunks out of other Royal Navy ships in a series of minor collisions. And to be fair, there are lots of friendly fire incidents that occur on both sides, both in World War One, World War Two, and various other conflicts. But usually these sort of spectacular runs of bad luck occur once to a ship and not thereafter. Whereas, you know, Megami torpedoing a bunch of transports by accident and then ramming Mikuma, that's kind of a lightning striking twice incident. At least when it comes to fatal damage, as I said, a number of vessels of various descriptions had reputations for causing minor damage to ships on their own sized at semi-regular intervals. John McDonough asks, My father told me that on the island of New Georgia in the Solomons, there's a spot in the jungle where there's a pile of 20,000 gas masks. It was the first thing that everyone threw away. The only useful part was the rubber hose that was cut up and wrapped around dog tags to keep them from rattling around as the noise drew fire. Was there any equivalent to this in naval history? Something that was so useless it was tossed at the first opportunity. 
I would find it hard to believe as ships are very different from infantrymen, but I'm happy to be surprised. Generally speaking, as far as I'm aware, things never quite got that bad. Um, if you go back to the age of sail, in some cases things were carted right off the side as soon as the ship was outside of land. Um, most often that would be you know, rotted food that they'd been supplied by some corrupt purser. Um, or occasionally some of the more questionable um, scurvy cures and things like that and very quietly and quickly went over the edge as soon as there was no one around apart from the ship's crew to witness it. There is, however, quite extensive records of certain bits of equipment being installed that proved to be completely and utterly useless that were then very quickly decommissioned, taken below decks, or just effectively cold-shouldered for the rest of the ship's voyage. But because they tend to be relatively expensive bits of equipment that were out on test, you couldn't just chuck them over the side, but you'd do your level best to forget they existed and hopefully get rid of them as soon as you got back to shore next time. Um, this was very prevalent in the 1890s and 1900s when lots of experiments, especially to do with fire control and ranging, were being undertaken. But more generally, something that did end up going by the wayside, uh, at least when you had fairly competent commanders around, were the more stupid signals. So good captains and admirals, when they got a signal from on high, whether that be from a, an admiral further up the chain or from the admiralty at home, if they got a signal that they could tell was patently stupid, i.e. was going to put their ships in unnecessary suicidal danger or was just going to aggravate the men or aggravate a situation to no good effect, they would quite often do the modern telegram equivalent of Nelson putting a telescope to his blind eye and just chuck the signal paper overboard or chuck it into a fire or something and because well if you don't have any physical evidence of the signal arriving well then clearly the signal never arrived there must have been some problem with the radio and therefore you didn't have to follow that order which would generally be all to the good the almighty hypnotoad asks how do Canadian destroyer and escort commanders such as Harry de Wolf compare to other commanders in similar roles during the World War II period? Well, as with most of the navies with fairly large numbers of ships under their flag, the Canadian destroyer and escort commanders range across the board. You have some who are basically useless um, one of the early captains of hms sackville or hmcs sackville i should say um was so bad he was actually relieved mid cruise uh, during his first voyage by his executive officer <laughs> and quietly put ashore so that's kind of the low end of things someone who's just not capable of handling the responsibilities they've been given on the other hand you have people like harry de wolf who is up there with the best and most aggressive destroyer commanders. Um, there's a reason that Haida got the reputation that she did in the Second World War, and a lot of it was down to the command style of De Wolf. So, you know, at the upper end, Canadian destroyer and escort commanders are easily fighting out for a top five position in terms of, you know, the most aggressive, the best results, the best tacticians, etc., etc., um, and as I said, kind of the rest of the range in fr from there on down. Mark Rice asks, how far apart were TF-16 and TF-17 operating during the Battle of Midway? Based off Japanese forces citing the task forces separately, I grew up assuming that they were quite far apart, but I recently read that Enterprise could see Yorktown's fire damage through binoculars on the horizon. This made me start wondering if they weren't quite as far apart as I was thinking. Well, here's a chart of the two task forces manoeuvring along with the Japanese over there on the left. And I've tried to approximate the distances between the two task forces at different times um, using these rather crude red lines. But as you can see, the distance between task force 16 and task force 17 varied quite considerably during the day. So it could get approximately up to about 40 to 50 miles apart on the central track line although of course some of the escorts on either side would uh, of the task groups would be or task forces would be a little bit closer but at other times they could be considerably closer as close as 15 20 miles and towards the end 
um, when, which is going to be when you can see Yorktown's damage, which will be the near horizontal red line down in, near, in the middle of the right-hand side of the chart, that's one of the instances where the two task forces are actually much closer together. And you can see, you know, in the immediate run-up to that, Yorktown has been running east and then southeast, whilst um, Enterprise and Hornet have been running northwest. So they're on a closing vector. So, you know, half an hour before they would have been considerably further apart, but at the time they're now much closer together, and that is actually within just about visual range. Jim Smitty asks... I was recently reading about how a U.S. Army officer was able to somehow sneak into a Soviet T-62 tank in East Germany and take photos of the interior of the tank in the early 80s. Granted, this was done on a military liaison mission, but it has me wondering, could a ship be so unmanned that that an officer that was there to liaise with the Navy would be able to take photographs of critical areas of a ship? If so, could these photos give critical intelligence to the side that somehow took these photos, or are there just too many people on a ship to try and pull off a stunt like this? Um, I think it depends quite a lot on what you define as critical, and also who's going to be benefiting from it, because if a Navy, or the nation that controls the Navy, is particularly hostile to another power to the degree that, you know, they might actually want to sneak intel from a ship. The chances of them letting a liaison officer on board are pretty slim. Whereas, you know, the more and more the two navies trust each other, the more and more they're going to allow liaison officers aboard and the less and less particular security they're going to be bothered about that officer having to be under. But equally, that makes it less and less likely that the officer in question is going to be wanting to go covertly around the ship finding things to send home but in the event that you know they perhaps wanted to do so for whatever reason then certain areas of the ship sure that might well be possible i mean again it depends what you define as a sensitive area of the ship these days with all sorts of fancy modern electronics and so forth There's probably a lot of areas that are considerably more sensitive than there were back in the time period the channel covers. But let's say, for example, you wanted to know how this ship's magazines worked and you, for whatever reason, didn't have access to that just by asking. Then, yeah, there would be opportunities if you had like a small pocket camera, say 5mm camera or something there would be opportunities for a liaison officer to probably get into those areas. It usually wouldn't be that when the ship's at sea, there are far too many people, but perhaps when the ship is ashore and a significant portion of the crew are out on liberty, and obviously the people aboard the ship are used to seeing this liaison officer wandering around, at that stage, you might then well be able to you know, find your way to a hatch that goes into the magazines, or in this case into... Uh, a shell ring and so forth and take some photos you might be asked a few awkward questions if you get discovered but there probably won't be too many people there and if there are in something this size you might well be able to find a space where you could whip out your camera take a couple of quick snaps and then stash it away again out of sight of other people But, um, as I said, I think it's kind of a bit of a catch-22 in that for a liaison officer to be granted sufficient access around a ship that he was able to pull it off, he's probably going to be from a Navy, which is close enough to the Navy in question, that he doesn't need to in the first place. Turkey Trots to Water asks, Could you discuss how likely a World War II-era battleship's main battery guns would have been to remain operational if the turret had received a non-penetrative hit to the faceplate from a battleship-caliber shell, as South Dakota had two guns deemed inoperable from splinters resulting from a 500-pound bomb hit hitting the turret roof, it seems like the massive force and resulting splinters of battleship-caliber shells would likely knock guns out even if they didn't penetrate the armour. Well, a lot of it is going to depend on the gun and turret combination in question. 
Um, now, with South Dakota's guns, they were deemed inoperable because some of the splinters from the bomb exploding had actually gouged chunks out of the gun barrels, which, for hopefully obvious reasons, would make it rather dangerous to try and operate the guns thereafter. Uh, nonetheless, if the faceplate of a turret was hit, as I said, if you're looking at like you know a twin 12-inch or something like that, then that is going to be a rather different scenario to hitting a the faceplate of, let's say, Yamato's triple eighteens. Uh, apart from anything, just in terms of the sheer mass of metal that you're hitting and the resultant effects, which we're going to discuss. Now, yes, if a battleship caliber shell hit between the gun turret between the sorry between the guns on the turret faceplate and the splinters spread out there is a, a reasonable chance that those splinters might take chunks out of a nearby gun or guns and that might render one or more of them inoperable if people notice in time um the also depending on how the penetration points of the turret face for the guns are shielded uh, you might have blast and splinters getting in there um that's what knocked out Lutzow's front battery while they were um trying to fight the Oscar Borg Fortress and related guns in the Oslo Fjord incident, the Battle of Trobak Sound. Um, you might also have just the sheer kinetic impact, and then and this is where the mass of the turret comes in. With a smaller lighter turret, the kinetic impact might be enough to unseat the turret from its runners. Um, maybe not by all that much, but by enough to jam it. Whereas, obviously, the you know, if we use, let's say, a 14-inch shell as standard, if that same shell slams into the much, much more massive, in all senses of the word, Yamato turret, that may not disturb it quite as much, and therefore it might not be unseated. Um, you've also got the potential spalling from the inside of the plate that's hit. If the plate isn't penetrated, that doesn't necessarily mean you're not going to get fragments popping off and whizzing around internally, which could, you know hurt people it could destroy mechanisms uh, and all sorts of other things so yes there are a number of mechanisms whereby a hit to the turret faceplate might disable one or more guns or indeed the entire turret if the hit is energetic enough and the turret is either thinly protected enough or is light enough that those effects are magnified however equally speaking the wrong impact angle a light shell sheer luck in splinter distribution etc could very well result in the faceplate taking a hit and people noticing that they've been hit but otherwise not a tremendous amount else happening roadrunner meet meep asks air to surface rockets how were they used and how effective were they outside of video games the only time i've heard of unguided rockets being used against ships was a documentary about the mosquito where a former pilot said that a salvo of rp3 rockets was equivalent to a salvo of eight inch guns well it wasn't too far off in that assessment bearing in mind that the british uh, heavy cruisers had eight eight inch guns and the typical attack aircraft including mosquito would have two racks of four rockets so an eight rocket salvo this is a little bit of a doubled up rack on a typhoon but nonetheless um, so if you fired eight rockets at a target the semi-armor piercing version of the rp3 actually had an explosive warhead that was about pound pound and a half more than the eight inch armor piercing or semi-armor piercing shell from a county class so yeah pretty much in terms of explosive payload and number of projectiles arriving it was a kind of a one-shot eight-inch cruiser blast in terms of their use against ships they were quite widely used you had the rp3s um the americans had m8s and hvars uh, and there are a few other air-to-ground rockets in use as well their use ramped up as the war went on um there's plenty of gun camera footage of the royal air force and the fleet air i'm using them quite liberally on targets in and around europe um there obviously there's also the use of rockets in air to ground warfare on land but uh, they were quite beloved of aircraft that were going out hunting merchant ships blockade runners especially um although in the pacific theater they were also used against warships in the european theater as well but they were quite useful in that they could deliver quite the punch 
um, in a way that was it gave the lighter aircraft uh, strike capability because they didn't weigh as much as bombs. So an RP-3, for example, weighed about 100 pounds, and that meant that you could slap, as I say, normally about eight of them on a plane, and it, you might think, oh, well, then why don't you just carry a 500-pound bomb or something like that? Well, a 500-pound bomb is a single point weight that then goes underneath, usually on the center line of the aircraft, and that has all sorts of drag implications. You've got to hope that the mounting point is strong enough, and you get one shot. You, know, you either hit with that bomb or you don't, which usually means you have to dive bomb. And fighters are not usually set up to be particularly brilliant dive bombers. Whereas if you put a battery of rockets, each individual rocket plus its launcher weighs less. So you can mount them on the wings. It's not going to impair the aircraft quite as much and weaker areas of the aircraft can carry them. Plus you get eight shots instead of one. And you can approach at much higher speeds at a sort of a more horizontal at angle. And when once you ripple fire them off, you can maneuver a lot better. So uh, the rocket launchers offered more attractive propositions for anti-shipping missions for fighters and even some twin-engined aircraft, as opposed to fewer, slightly harder to land on target bombs. And it also made the aircraft somewhat harder to hit because if you were coming in on a dive bomb, you know you'd usually be seen against the sky and then you had to come in on a prolonged dive so shooting at dive bombers wasn't dramatically difficult whereas with rocket armed aircraft you could obviously come in lower you would be a bit harder to spot in the first place you could be maneuvering right up to a few seconds before launch and then when you lined up you rippled off your rockets and you could immediately break away again which increased aircraft survivability as well Hi Bacon Bomb asks, were there any class of ships that were so different from each other that they could barely be called sister ships, and why? Yeah, there were quite a few at varying levels of difference, but the pièce de résistance, suitably enough given the phrase, is this lot. So this is ostensibly the Charles Martel class of French pre-dreadnoughts. As you can see, uh, they don't really look all that alike. Theoretically, there is a fifth ship in there, that's Bouvet, but she was re well, not redesigned, but she was designed to a slightly different spec, so she really is a true half sister. But uh, yeah, the other four, uh, which are Charles Martel, um, Massena, um, <laughs> the unpronounceable French vessel, which, um, yeah, begins with a J and the somewhat easy to pronounce Carnot, they ostensibly, along with Bouvet originally, were supposed to be a single class of pre-dreadnought built in response to the Royal Navy building the 1890s Royal Sovereign class. However, in that wonderful French pre-dreadnought fashion, the French Ministry of the Marine issued a specification and they said, right, we want the ships to be of this displacement, of this speed, and to carry this armament, um, which is why you can see certain common features, like the layout of the main battery. But then at some point along the line, they seem to have lost sight of the definition of class and decided that they were just going to, you know, they ask for designs, but then instead of going, right, we prefer this design, everyone is going to build a ship to this particular specification they decided actually we're going to have the the five specifications that have been submitted will all be built so you know they're all technically to the same spec therefore technically a class but as you can see apart from the main battery there is precious little that you could point to that would say that these ships are in any way shape or form related other than having come from the same country the breech-loading 15-inch 42 cal caliber Mark I naval gun, for when the other guy just doesn't take a polite hint, asks, In almost every documentary on the Battle of the Atlantic I have seen, the documentary makes a point of pointing out, like this fault was somehow made for the plot of that particular documentary, that when Allied ships went in for the gun run on German U-boats, they would lose sonar contact, which was then an opportunity for the brave and bold U-boat's captain to change course and or depth in order to avoid the depth charges, and thus a one-way ticket to Davy Jones' locker. 
Why would the sonar lose contact, and was this countered in other ways than attacking the U-boats with ranged anti-submarine weapons? By ranged anti-submarine weapons, I presume you're referring to things like Hedgehog. Um, so, ignoring that, the reason that they would lose sonar contact is that sonar, or ASDIC as it was called in Royal Navy service at the time, was at that point a directional sensor. We are used these days to sonar being 360 or near enough 360 um, in terms of its coverage of the ocean, but that involves a spherical sonar array or hemispherical sonar array, which is then mounted in a large bulb under the ship. Now, while sonar installations did involve a small protuberance under the ship, the kind of large hemispherical arrays that could give you full all-round coverage were something a little bit for the future at this stage. And therefore, with the uh, sensor arrays only aligned in a particular direction, i.e. the forward arc, it meant that you would have your sonar deployed and then obviously if you wanted to attack and you only had depth charges, well the depth charges went off the back or the sides of the ship, so you would have to pass over the contact as soon as you passed over the contact, your sonar was now looking too far forward, and as you mentioned, this would be kind of the, the opportunity for the sub to get out of the way. Now, how was this countered? Well, towards the end, you do start to see the development of wider coverage arrays, but in the more immediate term, even before the introduction of Hedgehog, or sometimes instead of it, a number of other tactics were developed in order to not lose the sonar contact. Uh, one of these was fairly simple, and that was that the ship that was maintaining the sonar contact would drop its speed so and change its course to follow the sub so that it would continue in contact, and then it would signal via radio or, or light to an aircraft or another escort and basically tell it, what it had found. It's like, hey, I found a U-boat over here. I'm keeping contact with it. It is 500 yards ahead of me, uh, 20 degrees off my port bow or something to that effect. And then the vehicle that it had uh, communicated with, whether that be aircraft or ship, would then come in and do its own attack run, effectively blind, relying on the data from the tracking vessel. Now, this did have some advantages because, of course, prior to the introduction of things like Hedgehog, the U-boat captains knew that if they were hearing the sonar or ASDIC pings, then they weren't going to be attacked by the target vessel. And it's when those pings stopped and the vessel passed overhead that they had to worry. Whereas with these techniques, the U-boat captain would be like, ah, well, he's taking a while to close on me. And then out of nowhere, you'd have a bunch of depth charges going off from a boat that had either just raced across it or sometimes would race up ahead and so appear to be going on a completely different course if the Germans were listening on their hydrophones and then cut its engines and drift backwards over the contact. And then obviously the one, the ship that was pinging away would say, right now, time to drop your charges and get out of there so you don't get hit by your own. And aircraft do similar things. That's basically the primary way of overcoming the loss of contact issue. Um, the other way uh, to do it is to line up, again this requires multiple ships, but to line up another ship behind you, which is it's a variant, but it, you have the attacking ship holding contact, then they charge ahead and drop their depth charges, thus losing contact, but the ship that's behind them, and obviously a safe distance behind because depth charge is about to explode, would take over maintaining contact and, if necessary, change course and follow up. Reichsbeer Minister asks, What Muppet allowed the K-Class to be fitted with a steam engine, and why wasn't he stopped? Since this whole design is or was a dumpster fire, what on earth were they thinking? So, I have a little bit of a soft spot for the K-Class. Not that they were a particularly good design in practice, but uh, a saying I've mentioned a few times on the dry dock, there was method to the madness, though madness it remained. Basically, the K-Class were the a very, very early attempt at a fleet submarine. Um, you know, like the Gato, Balao, and Tench classes would be in World War II. The big problem 
was that although the ultimate target, i.e. a submarine that could maintain 21 knots on the surface, was actually the same for the K-class pre-World War I as it was for the American fleet subs of the 1930s and 1940s, the difference was about 20 to 30 years of development in diesel engine technology. Pre-World War I diesels just were not powerful enough in the sizes that could be fitted inside submarines to get them up to 21 knots, which was the battle line speed. The only way to do so was to fit something that had a bit more power density, and the only mechanism that was available that had the power density and output that was required was a steam turbine, and therefore a steam turbine set was fitted. Now, the, the entire purpose of these ships was slightly different to the fleet submarine program that the U.S. had in that the fleet subs that the U.S. had were supposed to stay with the fleet and then deploy to attack. The ideal usage of the K-class acknowledged that, obviously, again, at the time, battery power levels, etc., were not quite as good, was to accompany the fleet at speed and then once the enemy fleet was engaged and battle lines started manoeuvring, the K-class would break off, usually when the enemy had been sighted. They would break off, remain low profile, retaining their speed. They would try and manoeuvre around the enemy fleet or in front of it, depending on how it was manoeuvring. Then they would submerge and, again, depending on how things went, they would either wait for the enemy fleet to advance over their positions and fire or they would see the enemy fleet hopefully running away from the ground fleet at which point they would be able to fire so once they submerged they would actually be doing relatively little maneuvering on batteries under electrical power they'd effectively become a long mobile minefield um, and and that was basically the idea it was to kind of have an instant picket line of unseen torpedo armed craft which you could put in the path of an enemy fleet the idea in principle was sound visibility and spotting in the north sea was usually pretty awful um you know a, a small relatively speaking vessel like a k-class sneaking around at distance on the surface especially since it's not got any guns so it's not going to be engaging in the surface action might very well go unnoticed and then the fact it took five to ten minutes to actually shut down the steam plant and properly dive again wouldn't make too much odds because hopefully um, by the time you chose your position um, hauled up and decided to start submerging the enemy fleet is still going to be worried about engaging or running away from the Grand Fleet, so they're not going to be looking in your direction, and the overall pace of a large-scale World War I naval battle would give you enough time to get submerged and sit there and prepare to launch your torpedoes. So, that's the thought process behind it. And, as I've mentioned in a few other videos, in theory, it, it could have worked... Um, if, for example, the K-Class had been in service soon enough to be at Jutland in large-ish numbers and had, um, let's say, been tagging along with the battle cruisers, obviously once the battle cruisers go to full speed, they're going to be left behind. Um, but if BT had you know, actually signaled, you know, enemy in sight, they're coming this way kind of thing, um, it, i.e. the scouting had worked properly, then the idea of the K-Class having you know, been in the vicinity, knowing the Grand High Seas Fleet is coming forward, then submerging and waiting and potentially torpedoing the leading battle squadrons on their way past, it's, it's not entirely impossible that they could have pulled it off. Um, or, I mean, with, with Jutland specifically, them getting around the back to ambush is going to be a little bit difficult because as we know the high seas fleet did an about face and vanished into the mist which was a bit disconcerting for everyone involved um but it's there there what there are scenarios in a world war one battle where the k-class could have been made to work and uh, they did show up somewhat unexpectedly in the battle of texel video that i did uh, because again fleet speeds allowed for that to work and the concept's not entirely terrible. The big problems with a K-Class 
were that afterwards, you know, once they're actually in service in any significant numbers, not only have the battle line speeds for the Royal Navy increased so they can't keep up anyway, which is a little bit of an embarrassment, uh, but also anti-submarine technology has improved, um, spotting capabilities have improved. Obviously, after World War One, there's not a German fleet to, you know, go after, which, you know, the K-class potentially work in the North Sea, but not really... Uh, particularly great distances and then of course you have the specific design issues with the k-class like their rather dodgy diving capabilities and the various refits that are done to them so things start to you know fall apart for the k's about four or five months after they start to enter service which is why they end up being such a, a disaster they're kind of they're, they're shining moment if they could be argued to have ever had one uh, pass them by almost before they realized it and yes it's entirely possible that if you had a fleet of k-class and you deployed them at jutland a bunch of them may well be spotted on the surface or in some other way by destroyers and sunk and some of them may go down to various internal accidents etc but for the investment cost if they get a few spreads of torpedoes off and manage to hit three or four dreadnoughts that's not actually necessarily a terrible outcome. Um, I'm fairly sure most fleets would be happy to trade half a dozen subs for four, four battleships. Paul Christian Thompson asks, How much of a distraction and resource drain did the Royal Navy experience when patrolling Danish waters following the attack on Copenhagen in 1801? And how much did that change with the attack of 1807? Between 1801 and 1807, there generally wasn't too much Royal Navy resources devoted to the area, beyond what had been put there beforehand anyway as general convoy and trade escort, because although you had Nelson's attack on Copenhagen, the Danes were still trying to maintain some form of neutrality. Now, there wasn't an active, uh, aggressive war going on between them and the British, and as I said, so, you know, convoys that went in and out heading into the Baltic had pretty much the standard escorts they would always have. That changed as the situation developed through into 1807 and after the attack on Copenhagen in 1807, then it became a lot more of an active theatre. The And you get what's called the gunboat wars, um, where the Danish government decided well you, you know we've lost our fleet twice over so clearly that's not working we'll build a large fleet of gunboats and annoy the British that way and it worked to a certain extent it didn't it wasn't massively successful but it did force a significant um, diversion of resources from for the Royal Navy to the area there in, in terms of, sort of ships that you would use generally against the French battle line, um, such as it was after Trafalgar, etc., it wasn't too bad. Um, you'd get small ships of the line, usually 64s, sent through the area, um, some frigates, you know, 32 gunners and so forth. And the Danish gunboats generally, apart from one big attack on HMS Africa, weren't really capable of going after those rated ships of the line or the rated frigates, because they were too big, too quick, too powerful, and generally operated in the deeper waters where it was a bit unsafe for the gunboats to go on general seaworthiness principles. However, there was an awful lot of shallow water where the gunboats could go, and where the frigates and the ships of the line could not go. And here it was a much more closely fought thing. The Royal Navy obviously wasn't going to build little gunboats and send them all the way across the North Sea to take the Danes on one-on-one, -on -one. Um, but even some of the larger sloops still had too deep a draft to go in the areas where the gunboats could. And so you'd end up with brigs, cutters, and so forth of, of that kind of... So ships of 8, 10, 12 guns um, would be sent in to try and clear out the Danish gunboats because they could pop out and nab uh, merchant ships and harass larger vessels briefly you know when a, a larger vessel was passing through a narrow deep water channel and so forth much as they had done with africa and there was a lot of back and forth there so you'd get either single gun brigs or and or small formations of them 
and sometimes the British would come out on top and sometimes the Danes would come out on top and would capture some of these smaller Royal Navy vessels. Essentially it came down to even something as small as a gun brig would be better armed than any Danish gunboat, although the Danes also had, did have a number of gun brigs of their own. But if you had enough of the gunboats show up, or perhaps a gun brig of, of the Danish Navy and a few gunboats, you could take down a British gun brig or a sloop or whatever. And it, it, it drew in a reasonable number of the smaller Royal Navy ships that could otherwise be used for coastal patrol, etc. elsewhere. Um, now, it wasn't as bad a resource strain as you might otherwise imagine because, of course, it's 1807 through to 1814. And thanks to Trafalgar, the massive commitments of shipping that you needed to contain the Franco-Spanish fleets weren't quite as necessary. Now, the French were constantly rebuilding ships, but the Royal Navy definitely had the upper hand in the capital ship wars, which meant resources could be diverted to other areas. But um, it did also mean, you know, that you had multiple hot areas of operation, especially in the early 1810s when you had the War of 1812 going on with the States. So you had the British having to divert frigates and small ships of the line and so forth over to fight the US Navy. You had them with a small number of ships of the line and frigates and a lot of gun brigs and so forth over in Danish waters, plus still having to blockade the rest of Europe and a few other active theatres. Thy Hunter 61 asks, Who is the highest-ranking naval officer from the state of West Virginia, and what did they do in the US Navy? For the period that the channel covers, the highest-ranking admiral in the US Navy from West Virginia that I can find is this gentleman, Admiral Charles P. Snyder, uh, who entered US Navy service in 1900 and retired in 1946, so that's 46 years of service, and he reached the rank of four-star admiral. So, yeah, apart from the uh, the few that reached five-star rank, that's about as high as you can get. And of the those who reached the four-star rank, he's the one from West Virginia that has the longest amount of service. As far as what he did in the U.S. Navy, um, he was actually already in a command role by World War One um, through World War through the interwar period. In the lead up to World War Two, he was aboard various ships and then commanding various divisions. Um, eventually, in 1939, he was actually in charge of the battleships of the battle force. And so he was second in command to Admiral Richardson, who was in charge of the overall US Pacific Fleet. Um, but when Richardson was relieved of command because he didn't want to take the fleet to be stationed at Pearl Harbor, um, for various reasons, Snyder didn't want to serve under Kimmel. And so he was relieved of his of his position in the active fleet. And so he spent World War II as a member of the general board and as the first naval inspector general. So troubleshooting and presiding over committees that were troubleshooting uh, back at home, which was a role that he did throughout the Second World War before retiring in 1946. Waldo 739 asks... Now that you've done more research into the matter, I have a question about one of your videos, the What If Task Force 34 had been there to meet the Centre Force one. Nowadays, do you think that Task Force 34 with Admiral Lee would have acted the same as it did in your video? Well, the thing with those kinds of What If type videos is that there's a whole range of actions that could be undertaken, and the one that I chose was one that seemed on balance, the most likely given the character of Admiral Lee. Now, of course, once you've selected a particular scenario, the actual outcome of that scenario is still viable, liable to a whole load of different variables. But I think the underlying assumptions are still pretty much on, on the spot. Um, yes, Lee has radar. And so in theory... If he's got enough advanced warning, he could try nighttime ambush in the San Bernardino Strait. But by 19, by this point in the war, um, they also know a lot more about the capabilities of the Japanese long lance torpedoes. And they know very well that being bottled up at night in a confined environment with an enemy that can fire lots of long lances at you is not a good idea. So 
although he'd have the night action advantage similar to 7th Fleet down south uh, with the southern force, I don't think Lee would go for it in large part because, you know, the the ability to bottleneck with superior numbers the way that Admiral Kincaid did to um, Fuso, Yamashiro, Megami and, and friends isn't really there. This is a much bigger force, a much tougher force, and they can and probably will punch through and start lobbing long lances at you, even if you tried that kind of thing. Um, plus, of course, you know, apart from the battleship balance, you've also got the fact that Admiral Lee's force doesn't have as many cruisers or destroyers overall um, in terms of numerical advantage the way that the southern area combat did at Surigao Strait. So I don't think Lee would go for a night engagement. It's far too many variables. Yes, he has superior gunnery at night in theory, but there's a lot of other things that could mess things up and that's not the kind of person he is. So at that point, he's left with essentially three options uh, one go and join Tavi 3 and kind of backstop them when the for when uh, Karita comes down that's not really an option because it puts the Tavi 3 forces in too much danger and gives Karita too much freedom of action while he's out and about between San Bernardino Strait and his objective option two he can stick kind of to the northeast and pincer Karita try and pin him between the Taffy 1, 2, and 3, and the landing forces and his own ships. Again, based on what he knows at the time, not a good option, because you could end up with a lot of casualties to the uh, ships he's trying to protect, which then means that, essentially, the best option he has is a daylight gun action just to the east of the San Bernardino Straits, which is the scenario that um, we played out. And I think, you know, while yes, it does mean that the Japanese can use their daytime optics so they have decent fire control as well, you've got squalls and so forth that you might be able to take advantage of. Um, but, but by fighting in the daylight, it negates a most of the random variables that favour the Japanese. It only gives them one solid variable back. And Lee's got the gunnery and the radar and the technology to match or or possibly slightly exceed that anyway. So at that stage, it's, I think it's probably still the course of action that Lee would take. Now, of course, as I say, if you run that scenario half a dozen times, you'll get half a dozen different results, so the exact outcome might vary. But I don't think Lee's going to go for much else in the way of action, assuming, of course, that the scenario allows him to you know, get in position of his choosing. Christopher Villenfort asks, We know all about the all-forward battleships like the Nelsons, Dunkirks and Richelieus, but did any Navy produce or consider producing an all-forward cruiser class? And if not, can you explain why not? So one nation did produce an all-forward class, that being the Tournays, as you can see here. And of course the Megamis were later convert. well Megami was converted into an all-forward now, there were a few nations that also looked at the all-forward concept. The US had a couple of designs for all-forward cruisers. Much like the Tones, this was to deal with aircraft handling aft. With the Tones, as you can see, they had a series of scouting aircraft, but these were seaplanes. On the American ships, these were hybrid cruiser carriers, so they actually had flight decks aft and amidships, and thus that's why the armament had to be forward. There were some designs that had guns fore and aft as well, but uh, the British also looked into very early on the first batch of county class of potentially having three twin 8-inch forward, or maybe four, to see if they could get aircraft handling facilities off, so basically kind of like Tone herself. But pretty much all of the all-forward cruiser designs tended to do so to free up the aft space for aircraft handling facilities. The one exception that I could find was that when you got to the London subclass of the county class, and that at that point they were looking at the, you know, the Japanese Miyokos and their successors coming out and so forth, and they were getting a bit worried about the protection levels. And it was proposed at that point to basically build a miniature Nelson, i.e. three triple eight inch all forward, 
and then using the weight savings f that you gained from having the all forward design you could then in theory give the guns and the magazines and the machinery enough protection to withstand eight inch shell fire at decent ranges that was actually all killed off by the upcoming negotiations that would eventually result in the 1930 london naval treaty but if they would pressed on with those designs it's possible that the counties could have been split so you would have had the early runs of counties and then from london onwards you might have had this miniature nelson type cruiser as far as i can tell that seems to be the only time anyone seriously considered an all forward cruiser that was considered that way purely for gunnery and protection reasons everybody else's seems to be some variation of how many aircraft can we fit on the back the judge 2017 asks how was identification of enemy ships often so poor? I realise that senior leadership didn't necessarily have pre access to the resources of today, but ships were often misclassified in some ways that seem impossible, like the Battle of Samar. How do you confuse escort carriers for Essex class and Fletchers for cruisers? A lot of it is down to human minds trying to fit what they can see into what they think they know. Now, on the right, you have USS Hornet viewed from side on, so it's fairly easy to tell that she's a Yorktown-class fleet carrier. Well and good. On the left, however, is exactly the same ship, just viewed from a slightly different angle. Now, it might be easy at this scale to tell that actually that's still Yorktown, but if you look further away, so if you've got a computer screen, maybe take a step or seven backwards so you're six seven feet away or if you've got a phone screen just hold it out at full arm's length and now imagine there's the distortion of distance and maybe some haze and well are you looking at a stubby aircraft carrier aka an escort carrier or are you looking at a fleet carrier that just happens to be turned at a slight angle to you well, this is a quandary that was faced by the Japanese at Samar, except that they didn't know about the existence of the American escort carriers. And so if you're sat there looking and going, OK, well, I can see what appears to be an aircraft carrier, but it's a bit stubbier than normal. Are you going to invent out of whole cloth an entire new class of small carrier that you don't at this point know exists? Or are you going to think, oh, I'm just seeing a fleet carrier from a, you know, a something of an angle and the distance is making it diff difficult to tell that the ship is, in fact, angled. And this, I think, is pretty much what went through Kurita and his crew's mind. Because if you think that all you're going to encounter is big carriers, then if you see a carrier, it must therefore be a big carrier. And you can come up with a plausible explanation as to why it looks a bit weird. If at that point you then look at its escorts, you mentally will start to scale the escorts to what you perceive. So if you perceive that there is a fleet carrier there and you see an escort that is, say, two thirds the length of it, you're going to go, oh, well, what's two thirds the length of a fleet carrier? A cruiser. Therefore, these ships must be cruisers. And now you've concluded that you're facing a fleet carrier formation with a cruiser escort, which is exactly the kind of thing you'd expect to find. Only in actual fact, it isn't because you've made a fundamental error with your initial identification. But of course, you don't know that. Nathapon Hongsheron asks, many ships had the main belt curved for hydrodynamic profile, or some like the King George V also had a somewhat twisted main belt. How do you face harden these? I assume the individual plates were relatively small, so they didn't curve too much, but they did curve and twist them. But did they curve and twist them before or after face hardening? And how about some of the rounded turrets on early ships? Or do you just not do that in those cases? Related, I saw a picture showing Von der Tan's belt getting hit near the edge of the plate and then that knocked the plate off. How do you prevent shells hitting between plates from just passing through? So with turrets, there are two ways around it. Um, one is the same way you deal with the armour, uh, but the other thing you've got to remember is that a lot of turrets used homogenous armour, i.e. non-face hardened armour, or for those of you in the US, what you would classify as Class B armour. But some turrets were face hardened, and as you mentioned, you know, belts could be twisted or bent or curved to reflect the profile of the hull. And again, yes, you, you know, as you mentioned, the specific armour plates themselves may not be too 
uh, deformed themselves because they are smaller parts of a greater hull but there is still some warpage going on so how do you do that well it's very simple you can't really do that after you face harden the plates because face hardening creates differential hardness the outer layer is hard as the face hardening suggests the inner layer is soft and the outer layer being very hard is also very brittle so if you then put enough energy in to warp the thing you're probably going to crack the outer face at the very least which is not going to be good so when you're forging the plate in the first place you would forge it to shape and then once you have the shape ready bearing in mind this is a fairly massive thing um, so unlike when you're quenching say a knife or sword blade i mean you could get some warp when you cool it um, but it would have to be fairly substantial as compared to you know a relatively thin blade profile in any case once you've heated it up whether it's a flat plate or a curved plate of some description you then have to differentially cool it and that can involve a number of things depending on the method being used at the time by the nation in question uh, but one of the ways for example would be to spray the face hardened side with extremely large volumes of very cold water whilst applying lesser volumes of water to the back or you could use insulated pads uh, large slabs of asbestos being popular in some cases or various other methods but in any case you it's a simple case of shape it the way you want it make sure it's the right um, size dimensions etc and then you cool it um, with the faster cooling on the outside to create the face hardening and then you just hope you've got all the shaping right the first time around because that thing ain't going to come out of shape <laughs> now um, now as far as shells hitting between plates and how to stop them just passing through this is basically a matter of fit and hold so you don't want the plates to display sideways uh, because they will shear their bolts if they can't display sideways too much so you want to have the plates flush against each other and then as mentioned when you're bolting it to the ship's frame you put lots and lots of bolts in as well um, to hold it in place and then in theory although there will be a little bit of sideways motion because nothing is ever 100 percent perfect but in theory there'll be so little sideways motion that even if you hit right on the joint it shouldn't completely displace a plate one way or the other now of course that can come a cropper in some circumstances being hit directly on a joint of a plate will be a slightly weaker spot so the shell will find it slightly easier to penetrate simply because there is a discontinuity there um, but also depending on how it's bolted you could have um, for example the impact might distort by creating a lever action distort and ping bolts such that the plate actually swivels and then is able to displace horizontally or a variety of other factors there's not anything you can do to absolutely prevent it other than maybe take a leaf out of hms warriors book and go with tongue and groove joints between the plates but that adds a whole other extra layer of complexity and as they found with warrior it's probably not actually worth it anyway fletcher fletcher's fetching fletcher fletcher fletching fetcher fetching fletcher's fletcher fletcher fletchings gee, asks I know that you might be a little bit biased due to your heritage, but please regale us with the wonderful qualities of balsa as a naval building material. Honestly, if you are actually going to be building full-scale Age of Sail warships and you were asked, you know, can we use balsa wood, my advice would be don't. Um, it has basically zero resistance to incoming fire uh, to the point that I would seriously question as to whether your sides would be bulletproof let alone cannibal proof as we've established no one sides are really cannibal proof at close range but you are at least proof against musket balls for the most part um also balsa um unless it's very well seasoned and very well sealed will rot out a lot quicker than hardwoods the advantages of balsa are that the balsa trees grow very very quickly um and they, because once the wood has been seasoned and dried out, the logs are incredibly light, so transporting them is an absolute doddle. I mean, there are pictures of people um, 
online who are quite happily carrying around a balsa wood log without any particular strain or effort where if that log was you know the size well, sorry was of a more typical wood like cherry or oak you'd probably be looking at a log that weighs in the region of between half a ton and two tons depending on the wood and the size of the log but um yeah when that log is made of balsa you can just one hand it onto your shoulder no problem one of these days i think i'm going to have to buy a large balsa log and then use it for weightlifting practice and scare the ever-living daylights out of everybody else who sees me lifting it doesn't realize it's balsa but uh, anyway yeah so good for building rafts um good for building ships or small ships etc that you don't particularly need to last very long and as i said very easy to replenish but not not something i would use for a, a full-scale warship now what you what you could use it for um if you were going to be a little bit clever and inventive would be perhaps for the upper works of a age of sail warship because if you do that well the upper works aren't really supposed to stop much anyway so the fact that it's fairly weak doesn't matter but it's so light that you're not going to add much in terms of displacement to the ship and because they're not integral to the ship's structure if they rot out you can replace them very quickly so overall that would mean your ship would be lighter um, less top heavy therefore more stable faster etc etc um with you know rip and you'd have plenty of resources around to replenish them also if you were going to do riverine warfare and you needed a bunch of boats quickly with a fairly large carrying capacity balsa would be good for that um, if you needed to slap together a bunch of gunboats very quickly and you really weren't concerned with them lasting out too much um, you know basically one campaign and done kind of like the gunboats the british built for the crimean war again balsa would probably be a suitable material for that I would probably maybe build the frames out of something a little bit harder and then just plank it all up with balsa and you get really also because it's really easy to work really fast built low displacement lightweight vessels that yeah they're five years from now they'll be gone but who cares because you weren't expecting them to last that long anyway so yeah the balsa would kind of be my go-to solution for weight saving and kind of flat pack portable vessels that I needed quickly in a campaign. Um, imagine balsa kind of like the aluminium of the wood world. You know, you wouldn't necessarily want to build an entire ship out of it, but it's very good for superstructures and so forth. Well, as long as it doesn't catch fire. Blacksmith Panzer asks, I've heard the Deutschlands were constructed under a capital ship clause of the Versailles Treaty that significantly limited the tonnage of such ships, with the hope of limiting Germany to only constructing coastal defence ships. If this is true, or something similar is true to their construction, I've always wondered if this unintentionally forced the Germans to use such large guns on the Deutschlands. For example, if they just built the Hippers several years early, would the British have turned around and gone, no, that's heavy cruiser, scrap it. Additionally, if they were locked into using 11-inch guns, could a change of layout have made them better? For instance, something like Renown with, two, with three twins instead of two triples. The article in question is Article 190 of the Versailles Treaty, which reads, and I quote, Germany is forbidden to construct or acquire any warships other than those intended to replace the units in commission provided for in Article 181 of the present treaty, that's which gives them six Deutschland class uh, to play with, the pre dreadnoughts that is. The warships intended for replacement purposes as above shall not exceed the following displacement. Armoured ships 10,000 tonnes, light cruisers 6,000 tonnes, destroyers 800 tonnes, torpedo boats 200 tons except where a ship has been lost units of the different classes shall only be replaced at the end of a period 20 of 20 years in the case of battleships and cruisers and 15 years in the case of destroyers and torpedo boats counting from the launching of the ship technically speaking there is nothing to actually limit what caliber of gun you put on those ships uh, but the displacement actually quite obviously limits what you can do now it doesn't necessarily force the Germans to use the 11-inch guns on the Deutschland-class Panzerschiff. All it does is say, well, your biggest class of ship you can use is to replace the pre-dreadnoughts, and, well, you can only do that up to 10,000 tonnes. The idea, as you mentioned, was 
broadly to try and force the Germans into building coastal defence ships on the theory that, well, even a reduced Germany would want some way of defending its own coast, and a small coastal defence ship with 11 or 12 inch armament was about all you could realistically hope to build on 10,000 tons. And indeed, the Reichsmarine, as it was known at the time, did actually look at various options for that kind of vessel before they eventually settled on the Deutschlands. They could, within the bounds of the Versailles Treaty, have built 10,000 ton treaty cruisers as their six replacement ships. Um, and yeah, that would have been absolutely fine. Uh, not the Hippers, because the Hippers are hilariously overweight, but something like a treaty compliant Hipper with eight eight inch guns would have been perfectly acceptable as a replacement for the pre dreadnoughts. But this puts the Germans in a little bit of a quandary because if they make a 10,000 ton heavy cruiser, well, they can make a maximum of six and practically everybody that they could conceivably go up against has just as many or more, <laughs> at which point they're just going to lose. So what's the point? Uh, equally, they want to have some kind of overseas reach that isn't a small cruiser. And so the only option they felt was to combine a somewhat heavier armament so you can at least lay some notion of claim to the idea that you're not completely stepping down in capability from, you know, a early 1900s pre-dreadnought, whilst essentially still making a commerce raiding heavy cruiser, and hence you get the Deutschlands. Now, it, once they've decided that they are going to use 11-inch guns, would a change of layout have made them much better? Mm, I don't think a uh, renowned style three twins would have made a huge amount of difference. Um, there isn't really any scenarios that they found themselves in where it would really help. Unless, of course, you went down my favourite route of almost all things for interwarship design and just had uh, a kind of a mini Dunkirk style layout, i.e. your two main armament turrets forward, in this case a pair of triples, one super firing over the other, and actually for a commerce raiding cruiser that may not be such a bad idea because you could include more extensive air facilities aft. And it would also allow you to concentrate armour in such a way that the Deutschlands then might also be able to resist 8-inch gunfire at reasonable ranges. So that might end up looking something a bit like this. Duke Master asks, you've mentioned RMS Titanic may be surviving a bit longer if she head-on collided with the iceberg instead of scraping it. I've had thoughts about this for some years since I've seen other ships surviving head-ons. Could RMS Titanic have done something similar? A huge amount depends, I think, on exactly what the mechanics are. If Titanic just, you know, headlong rushes straight into the iceberg, then... I think the damage is going to be enough that she'll eventually sink, but it'll take longer because the breach sections are individually smaller, the affecting her buoyancy somewhat less, and, well, she's brought to a dead halt pretty quickly, so there's not going to be much in the terms of water pressure from her you know, moving forward, driving the water into the hull. Um, but, you know, it depends how many compartments are breached and how long. Now... Are there circumstances in which she might survive, period? Yes, but it's going to come down to a number of things such as what speed is she going when she hits the iceberg? That's pretty important. Um, you know, if, if the iceberg is spotted as far out as is reasonable in the, uh, in the conditions that were available that night and she immediately goes on to full reverse, that might give her enough of a speed reduction that it'll reduce the energy of the impact such that perhaps, well, you'll still have a lot of flooding, etc. up front, but um, there might be enough buoyancy left that the water won't overflow the limits of the bulkheads as it did historically and then pull the ship down nose first. Um, I mean, you might even get a World War II style scenario where the impact not only... Um, smashes in the bow but maybe causes a portion of the bow to fall off that might actually be better because those sections are flooded anyway only now you don't have the dead weight and titanic can either be steamed or towed backwards there's also somewhat more outlier conditions such as you know if she 
I mean, we know there was an underwater shelf of ice because that's what ripped open her hull. Um, but it's possible that if she rams the iceberg at a particular angle or in a particular way or in a particular location, that she might actually get stuck in or on the iceberg, at which point, obviously, the the buoyancy of the iceberg will be partially supporting her bow, which will again minimise flooding and allow more time for damage control to be done. You just have to hope that as and when the iceberg decides to tip or roll, that that will detach the Titanic from it. So yeah, th there's a possibility that a head-on ram might be survivable. Um, I wouldn't necessarily be holding my breath, and it certainly wouldn't be a very pleasant experience. Conelid asks... I've heard from somewhere, possibly on this channel, that Japanese night optics were significantly superior to US night optics. I'm curious as to the particular reasons why. Did they just have a better way of gathering light? Did they have some kind of better technology in their lenses or similar? Or did they just put people on watch that were part cat? Selection for night combat duty um, in, in terms of being on watch in the Japanese Navy did require an aptitude for night vision, but they also had a number of other um, benefits above and beyond most others especially the US Navy one of which was simply the fact that their night spotting equipment the binoculars that they were given had very large lenses compared to most other people so the biggest lenses were 21 centimeters across um, and you know the 15 centimeter lenses were also fairly common which meant that you know, they, they could gather a huge amount of light as compared to somewhat more portable but smaller lenses, which is why Japanese night spotting uh, binoculars were quite often mounted on monopods and so forth, because, well, they'd be ridiculously heavy to carry around more conventionally. Secondly, they invented a set of filters uh, which they put over the lenses and these filters specifically were very good at dragging in ambient starlight and moonlight to help enhance what you could see so in some ways a form of basic early night vision um, albeit a passive one so if you combine the fact that the lenses are gathering in much greater amounts of light than they would normally that than average anyway and then the filters are gathering in additional light it gives the Japanese spotters far better visibility. And if they have better visibility, then they can see what's going on further out and in more detail. And then they can relay that to their commanding officers who can then take the appropriate decisions. And that basically is why in an optical spotting environment between the Japanese Navy and the US Navy in the first part of the war, 1942, the Japanese almost always come out on top. And then, of course, you combine that with parachute flares and star shell and all the other stuff, and you have a pretty effective night battle doctrine. Todd Webb asks, During the Boston Molasses Flood, US Navy sailors assisted in the rescue operations. Do you know which ships were in harbour in Boston for this? I wasn't able to track down exactly how many naval vessels might have been in or around Boston Harbour total. Um, I was able to track down naval vessels that were in the immediate vicinity and had something to do with helping out with or being affected by the molasses flood. The one that crops up an awful lot is this training ship, which at the time was going by the name USS Nantucket, but had multiple names during its lifetime. Um, there was also a basically a barge, uh, which at the time was the technically speaking USS Bessie J. Um, it was a barge that had had that name before and had been brought into US Navy service. There was also the USS Mount Vernon, which was a German liner, which previously had been called Kronbridsjes in Cecile, um, now again in US service. And there was the USS Starling, which was a minesweeper. And of course, also nearby was USS Constitution. So no particularly major warships got directly involved. Uh, the commander of the Navy base, such as it was in Boston, did offer to bring in more manpower and ships, but was told by the mayor that uh, help wasn't necessary. And so that seems to have been about the extent of U.S. Navy involvement in the event. John McCarthy asks, I've seen several ways of measuring a ship's length. I understand why someone would want to know the waterline length and the overall length, but what about the length between perpendiculars? What does that tell you about a ship? 
the length between perpendiculars is a little bit of a holdover, uh, basically from the era that you get things like Tun's Burthen, where people were more interested in working out how much a ship could actually carry, rather than necessary it, its exact length or its exact displacement. So waterline length is fairly self-explanatory. Overall length is also fairly self-explanatory, you know, from the furthest point of the bow or whether that be bulbous bow or uh, a raked bow all the way to the furthest point of the stern. Uh, length between perpendicular starts at the same point as waterline length. So on the waterline point on the bow. So in this picture, that would be just to the left there. You can see the um, the anti-fouling paint coming out of the water but whereas the waterline length going aft you would go along to the stern of the ship where the water is obviously at the level and then say right that is the waterline length for the perpendicular length you would go back to the stern post or rudder post or equivalent point thereof if you have multiple rudders and the reason that that was held to be the you know, the length between perpendiculars was that this was thought to give you a good idea of how much length of the ship could be used for carrying cargo. The idea being that anything forward of the rudder or stern post, especially in an age of sail ship where you don't wouldn't necessarily have a screw and its propeller shaft taking up volume, anything forward of that can probably be used for storing cargo in some way, shape or form. Anything after that that's overhanging is probably going to be officer accommodation or something similar and therefore not particularly relevant to the commercial interests of the vessel's owner. Graham William Kidd asks, are there any incidents of a U-boat wolf pack attacking a convoy whilst surfaced? I could see this occurring if the convoy escort was small in number and consisted only of lighter craft. There are plenty of incidents of wolf packs attacking convoys whilst the U-boats are surfaced. In fact, this was the primary preferred method for U-boat wolf pack attacks in the earlier part of the Battle of the Atlantic, in large part simply because, as with pretty much all submarines of the, that war, they couldn't catch up to convoys um, whilst they were submerged. Attacking convoys during the day would mean you had to launch while submerged, but that required you getting into position first, and that was usually done at night. But ideally, they would try and sneak as close to the convoy as they could and then when they're on the surface run in launch torpedoes inside the convoy and then pass through the rear of the convoy and drop down um, now obviously that might mean a submerged approach to get past the escorts but at night it's a lot easier to get past the escorts in the early part of the war because of you know, low visibility um, and if you're moving more quickly on the surface there's a less time for the escorts to intercept you and b you can't be picked up on sonar what tended to do away with that particular method was, of course, the greater prevalence of high-resolution surface search radar as the war went on, which meant that a moving U-boat on the surface could be spotted. But that's why when you look at a lot of U-boat wolf pack attacks in the first to middle part of World War II, you'll see lots of references to ships firing star shells and illumination flares because they know that the U-boat's out there somewhere in the darkness. Uh, or multiple U-boats, and they just are trying to see them. Jonathan Smith asks, Listening to your answer on the Battle of Falkland Islands in Drydock 229, it made me wonder, was the channel at Port Stanley narrow enough that SMS Gneisenau could have sacrificed herself to block it, thus giving the remainder of Von Spee's forces a better chance to run for it? Theoretically, yes, it is possible. So this is Stanley Harbour, so the... British ships would have been down in the bottom left here and assuming that the depth charts haven't changed too much since then um, which I doubt they have the area that I've highlighted in red is the area where a ship the size of Gneisenau could theoretically cause issues now obviously you know, there would be other British there were a couple of British ships in the outer harbour as well but you know the 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 Stanley Harbour, the main part of Stanley Harbour is the interior bit. Now, obviously, you can see there's a narrow opening. Uh, a ship the size of Gneisenau would pretty much physically block that um, if it got itself broadside on. So it would be physically impossible to get through. Um, 
once you're past that choke point into the upper two thirds of that red box, there is a deeper channel which can allow for you know fully a fully loaded invincible class battle cruiser to come motoring through and it kind of fans out in a cone shape from the entrance there until it reaches the widest point which is kind of the wide the full width of this red box if you put Ganizer now down in there again broadside then she would be laying across the deepest part of the channel um the water on either side is about 20 to 25 foot deep so if you were really lucky and you weren't running and you were running fairly light you might get an invincible through there um, but there'll be a good chance of grounding some of the lighter ships will still be able to get around but it'll be difficult once you get anywhere north of that red box however the deep water has spread so far that all you're doing is causing a minor hazard to navigation and you know, ships could maneuver around you. As for would she actually stand a chance of successfully getting there in time to do something? Probably not, because when Von Spee's leading forces decide to break off, they are up somewhere just to the bottom right of this picture. Uh, they haven't even come around this headland yet and the british ships are already on their way or the leading british ships at least are already on their way through this main part of the harbor that sort of forms the center of the picture and on their way to intercept so yeah even if ganizer now had decided she's going to go full pelt and try and get into this red box zone to cause problems there would have been multiple British ships already having exited and you know, shooting at her at point blank range in order to stop her. So that makes it relatively unlikely that A, she'd get there and B, if she did, that she'd accomplish a tremendous amount in the immediate term because, as I said, the majority of the British ships would already be out. Um, it's theoretically possible for her to get there, period, um, but that would require a much earlier approach in the hours of darkness. Robert Knapp asks, why did the Royal Navy keep so many of its heavy cruisers on anti-blockade running and eastern waters operations in 1939 through 42? When you look at global deployments, it's surprising, at least to me, that the numbers are not obviously in frontline areas. It feels like these ships were ideal for dealing with Italian heavy cruisers in the Mediterranean, but they very rarely seem to see service there, where the majority of work tends to be done by lighter cruisers and the towns. Now, to be clear, there were some counties in the Mediterranean, and there were counties in the home fleet, Suffolk and Norfolk being a good example in this period. Um, Berwick was uh, variously in the Atlantic and in the Mediterranean, but you're right, you know, ships like Dorsetshire uh, and Cornwall spent a good chunk of this period in more distant waters. Now, whilst, yes, in theory, it would be nice to have a few more counties to throw at the Italians, the fact was that you did need cruisers to go out and conduct these operations, inspections, taking out blockade runners, Hilfskreuzer, um, German surface raiders, and so forth. And for this, the counties had a number of advantages over the towns, Arethusers, and Leanders. Uh, for a start, the counties could just go further. They had a longer range, so if you put one of the six inch cruisers out on the station that you put a county on that six inch cruiser would have to be dropping in to refuel more often and therefore its actual time on station doing its job would be reduced it would be less effective and it might have a lesser margin of fuel when it comes across an enemy ship another factor is the fact that well you know arguments six inch versus eight inch either way the eight inch gun shoots further and hits harder which in a scenario where you're potentially going to be running across all sorts of weird and wonderful German raiding vessels is actually quite a considerable advantage. A county class can sit and plink away at anything up to and including a Hilfskreuzer that the Germans send out there, and there's pretty much nothing the Hilfskreuzer can do about it. Whereas the six-inch gun ships, okay, maybe a town could probably do that, but pretty much all the six inch ships at least by the time the counties have been refitted 
have less protection and would usually need to get a little bit closer which puts them theoretically in range and that's doubly so if you run into german or later japanese surface raiders that are actual warships and you know the fight with graf spey had demonstrated quite clearly that if sheer or lutzau got out or you know one of the hippers well a six inch cruiser apart from a very 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 well fought town probably is going to die horribly and numbers are spread thin so you can't have you know three or four cruiser groups the way that you had at the beginning of the war and even you know the best of the best of the towns so like belfast and edinburgh would still be on a bit of a, an upward slope trying to defeat something like a hippo which outmasses it by a factor of about 60 to 70 percent or a deutschland which has armor to resist a reasonable amount of six inch shell fire and of course the neither belfast or edinburgh can resist 11 inch shell fire particularly well whereas exeter had proven that eight inch guns were perfectly capable of punching holes in anything that the germans sent out that wasn't a scharnhorst or a bismarck and so a well-fought county class would should in theory be able to take on a uh, hipper so hip or prince eugen um or sheer or lutzau with a reasonable chance of either winning outright or at least doing so much damage that that was the end of that german raider's career um, so it made more sense for them to be out there in terms of threat levels as well in some ways you were seeing the counties in very specific ways doing the role of what fisher had enabled had envisioned the original battle cruisers doing i.e by deploying fewer larger more heavily armed ships on distant commerce protection you were enabling the release of more numerous smaller ships to actually then go and fight on the front lines andrew Waite asks germany successfully applied diesel propulsion to the deutschland class pocket battleships and diesel propulsion was initially planned for the cancelled h39s could other nations' warships, such as the King George V's, have benefited from using diesel over steam turbines? I'm guessing the key advantages would be increased range, eliminating the need to carry boiler feed water and the elimination of risk of boiler explosion, giving the option of maybe perhaps thinning the armour over the machinery. Could weight or space have been saved by replacing steamed turbine machinery with diesels in ships laid down in the late 30s and early 40s? Generally speaking, no. The problem with marine diesels at the time period of world war ii is that their power density is much less than steam turbines so what that means is that if you want to keep something approximating a sane machinery space volume you have to accept total power output is going to be lower and you're going to be slower alternatively if you want to move at uh, something approximating a reasonable pace you are going to have to have a very large machinery space and a large machinery space means more weight in for the, of the machinery which means less weight is available for armor or firepower and also means that if you want to keep everything still protected your citadel is going to be larger which means your reduced weight available for armor is going to be spread out over an even larger area this is basically why the deutschlands are limited to 28 ish knots as opposed to the sort of 32 plus knots that all the other heavy cruisers were capable of going at so unfortunately that means for most vessels it's not really an option uh, for a long-range commerce raider like a deutschland there are certain benefits uh, especially as you mentioned in terms of overall range but, uh, for example, destroyers, you know, they're not exactly high on space at the best of times, and they do need to be moving a fair bit quick. Um, cruisers, likewise, they need the speed, uh, and cruisers are very tightly constrained by the treaties. Battleships, well, everyone settled on the sort of fast battleships, roughly being around about 28 knots, except for the French, because uh, they have magical turbines and boilers but um in any case if you were going to take a king george v and make it diesel powered if you wanted to keep that 28 knot top speed you're then going to you know remove the armor um or a good chunk of it which is a bit problematic or reduces its um low weapons loadout uh, perhaps uh, 
an all forward 14 inch British Richelieu style KGV might be able to save enough space and weight by doing that to use diesel machinery but then it's going to be down a third of the original intended armament which is not necessarily a brilliant thing uh, and the kind of the list goes on aircraft carriers obviously also needing speed later on um, as you go through the 20th century and the power density of marine diesels increases they become somewhat more viable uh, but unfortunately, if you do want to keep up with everybody else, you aren't going to be using diesels in World War II for the most part. DM Phoenix asks, Generally speaking, what happens to stores of naval ammunition once a calibre becomes obsolete, such as the 10, 12 and 13.5 inch shells of early dreadnoughts? Are they melted down and recycled, dumped at sea, or are there just vast warehouses filled with them that still exist to this day, just in case? As long as guns of that calibre remain in service somewhere in the Navy or the nation's armed forces, the shells will be retained. So, for example, the 13.5-inch gun, mostly out of Royal Navy service, but there were a handful of 13.5-inch arm armed battleships in secondary roles in the Navy. And there were a number of coastal emplacements and railway guns that also used the 13.5-inch gun through into World War II. So stocks of the 13.5 inch shell were kept around although for obvious reasons they tended to ditch the bulk of older production shells and just keep the newer ones around because whilst there were guns still in service the projected use of ammunition was considerably less than if you had 10 guns on each ship and you had you know four eight or dozen such armed ships once a shell had gone truly obsolete as in there was no longer a gun of that caliber in service then, well, it depends on the Navy in question. Um, some of them would very carefully disassemble and recycle the materials, uh, but more commonly, you would either see them just taken out and dumped at sea in some deep sea crevasse that somebody had found that was quite useful for disposal of things. Um, very occasionally, people would forget about them sometimes. There, there are cases of fortifications that had been upgraded to a heavier caliber gun, subsequently being inspected and people going huh you know something like well this this fort has had 14 inch guns for you know, 30 years why is there several hundred 12 inch shells in this random room that no one's looked in for a while and depending on the caliber and the predilection of the local commanders uh, sometimes stock would be expended as the last guns went out of service so you know if if you've got the last operational 10 inch guns and there's a couple of hundred 10-inch rounds, you might amuse yourself by firing off a bunch of them before everyone gets bored and you send the last few off to be decommissioned. Um, on a much, much smaller scale, incidentally and humorously enough, um, when the 303 round was being removed from British Army service, I'm led to believe at least one base decided to try and expend several million 303 <laughs> rounds of ammunition by firing it all through a old Vickers machine gun in an attempt to also decommission the machine gun and it turns out that the machine gun chewed through I think if I recall correctly all of the rounds um, as long as you kept it topped up with water and was still good to go. Nicholas Ressar asks apparently the US Navy had two classes of pre-dreadnoughts with stacked turrets the Kearsarge of 1896 and the Virginias of 1902. I understand that the stacked turrets were not effective. Well, that's uh, putting it lightly. So why was it tried twice with more standard type ships in between? Basically, the time lag between actually designing a ship and getting it into commission. So whilst, yes, the Kearsarges were significantly earlier than the Virginias, when you look at when the Kearsarges are actually commissioned into the fleet and then start working up, they're only just entering service around the time that the final design plans for the Virginias are being concluded. So essentially there isn't time to work out with the um, Kearsarges that this was a bad idea before it's too late and the Virginias have been ordered. Plus, there are a few other issues which surround why the US went for the uh, double stack turrets. Part of the idea being that at the time that even Virginia was being designed, 
the rate of fire of the big guns was so slow that it was hoped that you know the fact that you had an eight inch turret welded on top of the 12 inch wouldn't make too much odds because hey if it's going to take you you know three minutes to reload your, your 12 or 13 inch guns depending on the class then you, you fire your main battery and then you can get four or five salvos off with your eight inch with slight adjustments to the turret's aiming point and then when the bigger guns are ready to go then you just wait for 10 20 seconds while you're firing the big guns and then you go back to firing with your eight inch thanks to the spanish american war the virginias were allowed to be considerably larger than previous ships uh, the intervening classes that you mentioned had gone with five or six inch secondary batteries and now that they had more tonnage, the U.S. Navy was like, aha, well, therefore we can have bigger secondaries. And the Virginians actually had 8-inch and 6-inch secondaries. Um, and then you know, they started building the Virginias, and it's only really whilst the Virginias are under construction that the Kearsarges start to demonstrate just how bad an idea this actually was, combined with the fact that a number of advances to propellant technology and gunnery mean that the rate of fire of the 12 and 13 inch guns is able to drop to a level where it's not quite the same as the rate of fire of the 8 inch guns but it's close enough that firing the 8 inch guns would interfere with firing the main battery guns and so the whole concept becomes fairly pointless even if the sort of stacked turret worked generally which it tended not to. Andrew Dederer asks, what was the Caribbean like for the bulk of the 19th century? The US sort of dominated the near area but had no bases in it. There were plenty of European island colonies that didn't seem to have much support on the mainland and weren't nearly the cash cows they had been. Was it the Wild West, Casablanca but with more water? Um, I know this is a more modern cartoon but it, it's basically best sums up the situation uh, in the 19th century. So you know, yes, there's the Monroe Doctrine where the US is basically saying no one gets to play around in the American hemisphere without um, the US saying so, and in exchange they'll leave the European colonies alone. Um, in reality, for the bulk of the 19th century, the US was completely unable to enforce the Monroe Doctrine. In fact, the single biggest proponents and enforcers of the Monroe Doctrine were, as the cartoon suggests, Great Britain and the Royal Navy, of all people, mainly because Britain had all the colonies it wanted in that area and didn't fancy everybody else trying to grab whatever bits were left, or, for example, the Spanish trying to re-establish control over South America. And so it suited Britain very well to enforce the Monroe Doctrine when it suited it, um, because it meant that they didn't appear to be quite as, um, I'm not entirely sure what the word would be, quite as definite about their intentions as just turning around saying, no, we don't want you to do this. They could just turn around and say, well, you know, um, the locals, you know, these uh, American chaps they don't want you messing around in this area and so we as our benevolent uh, british overlords of some of these local islands we of course support them and will enforce their doctrine so you see it's not our fault that we're stopping you from conquering all these random places some of which you'd previously conquered and have kicked you out no 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 no. that that's blame the americans we're just you know enforcing what they said um, and of course that meant that whenever it suited british interest for the monroe doctrine not to apply it tended not to apply um and again you know there was not an awful lot that the u.s could do about it various french and spanish fleets showed up at various points to blockade various countries and as long as britain didn't care particularly all that much um nothing really tended to happen to the european powers who were theoretically interfering with free countries over in uh north and south america mostly south america and the caribbean um, obviously towards the end of the 19th century once the US starts to build up its navy then it can actually take the enforcement of the Monroe Doctrine a little bit more seriously in and of itself but for the most part the Caribbean was relatively quiet during the 19th century yeah the, the uh, islands weren't the massive cash cows that they had been before but these were still generating a reasonable amount of wealth and trade and people just sort of putted back and forth 
you know, trading in sugar and rum and all the other various products of the Caribbean, uh, whilst watching some of the uh, north coast of South America and Central American countries having their regular runs of coups and revolutions and so on and so forth. And, uh, well, the Caribbean itself wasn't the Wild West, but they'd had ringside seats to some being spectators or, uh, for some of the uh, more mainland shenanigans that were going down. Paul Goyne asks, I know you're not a big fan of the 16-inch super heavy shells used by the US Navy, but what about the 6-inch and 8-inch super heavy shells? Were the cruisers able to score hits at the ranges the shells were optimised for? Well, I should qualify the first bit, um, you know, yeah, I'm not the world's greatest fan of the Super Heavy shells. I completely acknowledge that they're capable of doing stupendous amounts of damage at long range. My contention is basically that the ranges at which their effects become most apparent tend to be a bit beyond what pretty much all evidence seems to point to as being sensible engagement ranges in World War II. And at the ranges that World War II was actually mainly fought in in battleship actions, a lighter round that going a heck of a lot faster would probably have had a bit more penetration um albeit that <laughs> the penetration in either case is mostly just absurd but nevertheless going on to the six and eight inch um i recall answering a similar question and i mean the six inch i don't think the six inch shell for the u.s really quite deserves the moniker super heavy when you look at the difference in weight from u.s eight inch shells and 16 inch shells compared to uh, 8 inch and 16 inch shells in other navies you can make a you know a fairly solid argument and say yeah these are significantly heavier the 6 inch shell is okay it is somewhat heavier but it's within the margin of error for everybody's 6 inch shells um and for the most part m most us light cruiser actions were fought at closer ranges where you know it probably doesn't make all that much odds to be perfectly honest um the eight inch shells on the other hand as i said those those do have a uh, significantly greater weight uh increase and occasionally u.s ships would be fighting at the ranges where their effects would come into play you know twenty thousand yards plus um albeit again long-range heavy cruiser actions are relatively rare even in the pacific the closer range cruiser actions somewhat more common and again at most of those ranges whether it's a super heavy shell or a standard weight shell didn't make too much difference so i'd say the the of the two cruiser grade shells the eight inch super heavies probably earned their keep a little bit better than the six inch but again, a lot of this is just down to the fact that, you know, ideally you'll be using these shells against your opposite numbers, the Japanese light and heavy cruisers. And what tended to happen is that in the early part of the war, when you fought Japanese light and heavy cruisers, with the occasional exception like the Battle of Komondorsky Islands, you tended to end up fighting at quite close ranges, or you ended up fighting Japanese destroyers and so forth at quite, quite close ranges, very often at night. And by the time you got past that period and you had radar and you could engage at longer ranges and so on and so forth most of the japanese destroyers and cruisers were no longer with us so <laughs> there wasn't much to shoot at i suppose you could probably look at something like surigao Strait uh, and analyze potentially what the damage the shells did in that particular environment albeit uh, i don't again i don't think there was a huge amount of difference between using eight inch super heavies and eight inch standards for poor old Fuso and Yamashiro so you know take it or leave it either way basically I would say that at least the eight inch shells I think definitely were a reasonable idea but they ended up in a war where they didn't really get too many chances to actually prove their merits my mum's basement needs more windows asks the Allies use terms such as D-Day to refer in a generic way to a significant date in a military operation. The Germans did the same, although they seem to have used a different letter for each operation. What do the Japanese Navy do? Whilst D-Day did get you know, a fair amount of colloquial use, especially after uh, the June 1944 invasion of Normandy, and it has subsequently sort of entered a common lexicon, uh, the Allies 
whilst they did tend to use D-Day and H-Hour quite a lot, they did have other letter days um, that they would assign for the equivalent of D-Day, i.e. the start of a particular operation, you know, A-Day, X-Day, Y-Day, etc. Um, so it wasn't a universal thing for D-Day, um, similar to kind of what, what the Germans were doing, actually. As far as the Japanese Navy is concerned, I'm not entirely sure myself. Um, I haven't been able to find specific references to them referring to a particular day by a designation, like insert letter or specific designation dash day here uh, kind of thing. I've not seen that much. Um, there are occasional operations where there's some kind of special signifier that says, right, this is the day we're we're doing the action or starting the operation but it doesn't seem to be consistent across the board at least from what i can see um, if anyone knows better obviously please let us know in the comments below fireteam joker asks what is the largest surface engagement that the us and uk fought in as allies i know the battle of okinawa is probably the largest in terms of ships but that largely wasn't a surface engagement you know, there's not really that many that I can think of. You're probably looking either for Savo Island, if you count the fact that the Australian ships are under the command of a, and well, technically the whole formation is under the command of a Royal Navy officer, Victor Crutchley, and Canberra is actually there, or possibly the sort of the chain of battles that led to the destruction of ABDA command. Uh, where you've got you know Marblehead in Houston and various US destroyers and Exeter and so on and so forth, but after that, the you know where you have large amounts of joint UK and US firepower combined, such as Arctic convoy operations, there tends not to be any Germans to come out and fight. And the one time there is a well, the two times there are fairly major engagements Barron Sea and North Cape they're pretty much entirely British affairs against the Germans and in the Mediterranean again the big battles Calabria um, Cape Spartivento versus the Second Serte etc Matapan they're all you know Britain and Australian ships against the Italians when the Americans are there you know Operation Torch Husky etc etc there tend not to be any really big major surface actions or if you count the various skirmishes between Vichy French ships at, and allied forces at during Operation Torch that's almost exclusively with US ships and back in the Pacific I mean there are cases of ships flying the white ensign participating in some fairly major battles but not really in the surface actions more as carrier escorts and then you get towards the end of the war, and you know, Surigao Strait is an American show, etc., etc. So, yeah, it seems... I, I think you're basically looking at either first Savo, Savo on a technicality or the fall of ABDA command, because other than that, every major engagement that Joint Royal Navy and US Navy forces have fought in in World War II don't really qualify as surface engagements. Brandon Minders asks, in a previous dry dock, you mentioned that early age of sail ships are not exactly watertight and sometimes rely on pumps and buckets to get the water out. However, the lowest part of the ships are usually cargo or ballast stone, and it's probably difficult to get water out with those things in place. Is that not a problem? Yes and no. Because especially when you've got when you've got ballast down there, the ballast is denser than water and if you've arranged it properly tends to occupy the vast majority of the volume so given the fairly significant reserves of buoyancy you have on most age of sail ships if you get flooding that is kind of flooding up to the level of your ballast it doesn't actually add all that much weight to the ship all that much just um, you know it's mass so you'll be a little bit more laggardly in the water because you know the container that is the ship is at you know going to need a bit more force to move around but it's actually not a tremendous you know risk to your ability to stay afloat uh, now some ships would have pumps the uh, pump tubes that actually sunk down into the ballast or into the cargo so you know 
you would then pump you act you would work the pumps higher up and then water would be drawn up from within so that was a possibility on some ships all of that tended to be in the latter part of the age of sail rather than the early age of sail um but yeah so essentially if the ship was small enough you could just go down there with a bucket and chuck it out and if the ship was large enough you only really had to start worrying about bailing once the water got sub got you know substantially above the level of your ballast uh, which could happen um, but even then, as I mentioned, I think it I think it was on the video on the Jesus of Lubeck. Um, at one point, they were sailing along and the gaps in the hull below the water had opened up sufficiently that they found significant sized fish swimming happily around in the hold with the ballast. Um, but whilst it made the ship significantly clumsier and it was making them worry because now, you know, there is water above the ballast and it's going up. It wasn't immediately threatening to sink the ship. Um, it's a very weird uh, dichotomy plus of course you have what i like to call the implacable problem um so for those of you who don't know hms implacable formerly duguay troyen i think that's how it's pronounced in french um one of the other survivors of trafalgar ship of uh, third rate ship of the line in the aftermath of world war ii the british government in one of its uh, perennial terrible decisions decided they didn't want to maintain the thing anymore took it out to sea and decided to scuttle it and the way they decided to scuttle it is the way you scuttle all ships in the 20th century you put explosive charges in the bottom and you blow out the bottom of the hold and this went about as badly as it possibly could be because yes you blew a bunch of holes in the bottom of implacable's hold at which point all the ballast fell out and the ship just floated around because now you just had a big pile of wood in the shape of a ship and wood is more buoyant than water and so it just bobbed around not really wondering thinking what am i supposed to do with this now <laughs> and they had to kind of basically break it up all at sea in the end which was a little bit embarrassing for everyone and something of a terrible crime against historical vessels but fundamentally this is kind of you know it is actually a legitimate thing if your situation gets so bad that you've got water flooding in at a huge rate of knots in you the hole where your ballast is chances are your ballast is going to fall out at which point you're kind of just ballasted in a different way um now obviously unlike implacable which is taken out to be sunk you might have like cargo and guns and crew up top who might be somewhat discomforted by this and you know the ship will become less stable um but it's not an immediate immediately fatal situation unless you're in particularly high winds cringe pog asks I've heard mention before that the Des Moines and her sister were capable of engaging high-flying aircraft due to their all-angle loading and timed fuse rounds. Was this an effective use of their time, or was this similar to the Yamato's Type 3 rounds? I mean, it's a little bit of a step back compared to what some of the lighter weapons can do because it's timed fuse shells as opposed to proximity shells, and even though they're auto-firing 8 inches, they're not going to put out quite the same volume of fire as 5 inch 38s so ideally a proximity fused 8 inch anti-aircraft round would be better but um, considering that they have the automatic firing and they have some pretty advanced radar and fire control systems sticking mechanically fused high explosive rounds into the Des Moines guns which is what they did for anti-aircraft use it's not entirely unfeasible uh, it certainly would be better than yamato's type 3 rounds for one thing as i said they've actually got the fire control to aim the guns somewhere in the general vicinity of the enemy in a way that might actually cause the shell paths to intersect um, and the time fuses to actually explode somewhat close to the targets so, as opposed to the yamato's 18 inch guns which kind of fire in that general direction and cause something like a distraction um, and for second well there's the rate of fire so more shells in the air more chances of hitting things um, and I suppose that's a ancillary thing but the other issue that makes them significantly better than the type 3 rounds is that well they are standard high explosive rounds with a uh, few uh, mechanically set time fuse attached to the top which means they don't do damage to the gun barrels the way that the type 3 rounds did so you know if you're if you've got a relatively predictable target or a large formation of enemy aircraft coming in 
at long distance sure blaze away with the uh, des moines eight inch round set to anti-aircraft mode there's a reasonable chance you probably will hit a few things paul christian thompson asks how useful were the ships that the german navy um borrowed from other navies during world war ii generally speaking i think they were more trouble than they're worth because it meant that you had to create entire supply lines for parts and other su supplies to keep the ships running which were completely incompatible with the stuff that the germans were using and the more and more ships you brought in from the more and more different nations from more and more different suppliers exponentially became something of an issue now if you'd capture something really useful like a, a big cruiser or even a battleship well and actually been able to put it into service then that might have justified things but when you're trying to run a navy that's already got multiple torpedo boats patrol boats and destroyer classes which of which have their own slightly different supply lines and then you add in a dozen more supply lines each of which is supplying anything from one to four small craft it, it's a lot of hassle for not a tremendous amount of result now yeah okay fine the germans do need every hull they can get i suppose but for the amount of money they invested they probably could have just built some more of their own um, the most use that the germans seem to have gotten out of anything that they acquired from various other countries seems to have been in the kind of corvette through small destroyer range those ships a they tended to come in numbers greater than one and b they were somewhat useful to the germans in you know patrolling up and down the various occupied coastlines because for that you just needed mass numbers of ships and where possible if you could operate them in or near the countries that they had originated from you could basically raid their spare parts supply stores um, which would theoretically have been designed for these ships in order to keep them operational so there, there's a degree of utility when it comes to the smaller craft but anything that's really small or anything that's much bigger than a small destroyer as i said i think tended to be much more trouble than it was ever worth randy topeka asks would the uss lafayette ss normandy have made a good aircraft carrier conversion assuming that the fire in 42 had still gutted the upper decks but left the hull and machinery spaces intact well she would have had the same problems that most civilian uh, civilian ship to aircraft carrier conversions had you know lack of structural strength lack of military build watertight subdivision etc etc uh, which would have made her somewhat more vulnerable than the average aircraft carrier but she's still an immensely large ship over a thousand feet long so you could get an incredible flight deck on her she's got the speed and she's got the displacement i mean she displaces um depending on how you measure it possibly as much if not more as a yamato <laughs> and of course because you're not carrying armor and guns that's why she's so ridiculously large and as you can see from the overall hull shape there'd be a fair amount of volume available so i mean again conversions are always somewhat less efficient than purpose-built carriers but considering that you know the lexingtons which displace about to well initially as designed would have displaced about two-thirds of what the ss normandy dash uss lafayette did um were able to pull off quite a decent performance in the second world war then well if you look at theoretically you know this the, she uh, i would reckon a lafayette conversion probably would have been about as capable at least in terms of aircraft carriage as a midway in its initial format because if you compare the air group of a yorktown and the air group of a lexington and then look at the relative displacement differences you know one obviously being purpose-built the other being a conversion it roughly lines up with the original midway format and lafayette so yeah you would have ended up with a pretty good carrier albeit a somewhat vulnerable one um, so perhaps something that's best kept towards the rear of your formations and just can launch off absolutely massive strikes possibly could have run into the same issues that some of the essexes and the midways did of you know actually being able to carry too many aircraft for her own good so at that point you're not necessarily going to do the the fighter carrier 
of Ultimate Destiny because you'd end up with like 150 plus Hellcats or something ridiculous like that. But you could perhaps use her to have a decent combat air patrol group and like 50 plus Avengers or something like that and have her as kind of a, a heavy strike carrier. Grumman Cat asks, why did Tumblehome hull design present such a stability problem if a ship was taking on water when Tumblehome had been the standard for ship design throughout the Age of Sail and seemed to work well enough? Even ocean liners like Titanic and Queen Mary had something of a Tumblehome hull. Well, in the Age of Sail, the Tumblehome hull was somewhat forced on ships, partly because of the ridiculous weight of guns relative to overall displacement that obviously would cause stability issues up top, plus the immense turning moments exerted by the sails and masts, uh, which were obviously the ship's primary means of propulsion, coupled with the fact that, as I've alluded to a few times earlier in this dry dock and in others, wooden ships are really hard to sink because their basic hull material is buoyant, so some of the disadvantages of the tumble home hull weren't as apparent with Age of Sail ships, and it was necessary, as I mentioned, for stability purposes with sails and so forth. And to be clear, in a peacetime environment, and when you don't have your hull breached, a tumble home is actually a fairly good, stable uh, design. It allows you to have a fairly high deck, and therefore a high freeboard, um, and overall is a relatively stable shape. The problems come when you start taking battle damage and you start listing. So in very crude terms, in when you're talking about a steel ship that you don't have to worry so much about the top weight issues as compared to an age of sail vessel, um, in a steel vessel, when the ship starts to heal, the writing moment I, or the writing force, i.e. the amount of force with, that the ship is pushing back against healing over, is significantly reduced with a tumble home hull. Um, partially, again in very crude terms, this is because there's not a lot of volume above the water. So if you imagine either a square cross-section ship or a flared hull ship, as it heals over, a significant amount of what was previously above water hull is being immersed. And this creates you know, resistance to the continuation of that motion. Whereas with a tumble home hull, you can rotate and rotate and rotate and rotate, and you're not actually introducing all that much hull, additional hull into the water until you're actually quite severely over. And then when you are severely over, there's a relatively low volume of hull above the water to provide additional buoyancy. So basically it's much easier for you to go over on your side um, once you start taking the kind of rolls that would occur with you when you take combat damage. Um, or you hit really, really bad weather. The other problem, which is related, is that if you think about the shape of a tumble home hull, the outermost portions of the underwater hull are the furthest away from the ship's centre of gravity. So if you then start to flood and you don't just allow the water to run all the way across your ship, then the f amount of water, let's say if you have a thousand tonnes of water on the port side of your ship, if that's significantly further away from the ship's center line than it would be on a more conventionally hulled ship, then that's going to exert more of a capsizing moment, which is going to be a bit of a problem. And of course, as the as it rolls over, you have the same problems with writing moment, and you have the additional problem of you know you've got this big bulgy to underwater hull, so all the water is going to continue to collect there. So once you start taking serious underwater to damage, tumble home hull tends to roll over and stay there filling up until it just goes under. So, yeah, neither, neither of those things are as much of an issue with Age of Sail ships for the aforementioned reasons. Glamour Hammer asks, can you comment on the use of tracers in 20th century naval combat? Video games often depict warships as using tracer shells, not just on lighter secondary or anti-aircraft guns, but also on main caliber guns. Was this common practice? Not directly. So if you're talking about 6-8 or 6-inch guns, 8-inch guns, or you know battleship-grade guns, no, they did not have tracer rounds, by and large. Uh, not in the way that 40mm or 20mm or machine guns might. But 
a lot of the time they didn't really need them because a trace round is a very specific type of round. It either has something in the nose or something in the base which specifically burns with the intention of forming a traceable light that you can follow. However, with the larger naval guns, especially battleship grade guns, the sheer amount of energy that's put into the shell as it's fired tends to make the shell glow on its way out. Um, and occasionally, if you've used on kind of paint, it might also be actually literally on fire. <laughs> but usually it's just, you know, the heat of the, the shell itself. And you see this in numerous descriptions. Um, for example, in the descriptions of, the, of Admiral Lee's action, off of Guadalcanal with Washington and South Dakota, you read about sailors watching the main gun rounds leave their ship at night and the shells are glowing and they watch these glowing shells disappear up into the cloud layer, vanish from sight obviously, and then a few seconds later they reappear dropping through the cloud layer and they can see where they land. That's a tracer effect but it has nothing to do with traditional trace rounds. No one put something specifically to light the shells up while they were airborne. It's purely just the light emitted off of the shells as a result of the energy that they've taken on board on their way out of the gun barrel. Packer 910 asks, Why was the Royal Navy slow in moving its secondary batteries from casements to turrets? It appears that the French made this improvement with the Republique class pre-dreadnoughts. Well, it kind of comes and goes because... Immediately after the Republiques are laid down, you have this uh, wonderful lot, the King Edward VII. And as you can see, there are some secondary turrets along the side, and they're followed up by the Lord Nelsons, which have even more secondaries on the side. Now, granted, these are breech-loading 9.2-inch guns, and there still are casement-mounted 6-inch guns. But, you know, when you look at the Republiques, yeah, they have twin 6.4-inch secondaries, but they also have some casement-mounted 6.4-inch secondaries as well. So I think you can call it pretty much a wash. Towards the end of the pre-dreadnought era, there was a movement across the board to start shifting some of the, uh, in most cases, heavier secondaries into turrets. Um, obviously, the French were doing it with their general secondaries. But you also would see this in the early dreadnought period with, say, uh, Dante Alighieri, the Ita first Italian dreadnought that had some secondaries in turrets and so forth. Um, but the thing, the whole thing kind of dies away again as you get into the full dreadnought era. That's partly because the m most of the navies that have been putting uh, secondary guns in turrets are using the larger sort of 8.3, 8, 9.2, 7.5, etc. in turrets, and those calibers have kind of gone away as secondaries. It's dropped back to being 12 pounders, 4 inches, 6 inches, 5 inches, and so forth. Uh, and the same with the French, you know, the Corbets and the Britannias go back to casement mounts. And it's only once you, apart from the odd one like the Italians, um, you, it's only once you start to get towards the end of the First World War and into the 1920s that you start to see turreted secondaries returning. And uh, as I've gone into uh, numerous times, the reasons for the casements, you know, you can get more casement guns in than you can turreted ones. There's also It's also a function of size because, you know, e if you increase length as a linear dimension uh, for a 3D object, if you increase its dimensions linearly, you increase its surface area by a square and its volume by a cube. So as more and more, as the ships get larger and larger, I should say, deck area gets exponentially larger, which gives you more space to put turrets and gives you considerably more volume, therefore considerably more displacement with which to resist stability issues which occur when you put turrets up high, um, such as secondary battery turrets. So the, the Royal Navy isn't particularly slow in moving its secondaries from casements to turrets. Everyone's kind of doing it in the last stages of the pre-dreadnought period, both for their battleships and their armoured cruisers. Um, but as I said, then it goes away again. Interestingly enough, once you get to the immediate post-World War One period and, you know, dreadnoughts are now adopting uh, secondaries that are no longer going to be fully in casements. It's actually the British who are ahead. Uh, the Normandies, the Lyons, 
Amagis, Tosas, South Dakotas, Lexingtons, L20A Alphas, etc. They've all either got casement mounted guns or a mixture of casement and superstructure mounted guns. It's only the G3s and the N3s from that generation that have put their entire secondary battery into turrets. Um, just an interesting little factoid there. Logan W asks, in your videos on early dreadnoughts and battle cruisers, you mentioned on multiple different ships that they couldn't sustain their top speed for very long. Why is this when period ocean liners could maintain their speed back and forth across the Atlantic? There's a few different reasons. Part of it is that warships, some of them at least in this period, couldn't sustain their top speed for tremendously long because they used pretty awful coal. Um, this is particularly with the Germans. Whereas with ocean liners, bearing in mind they're charging a premium and their entire reason for being able to charge a premium relies on premium service, the ocean liners were then capable of buying the best coal, or at least not awful coal, which made things much, much easier in terms of keeping the boilers going. So therefore they could keep going for longer. And, you know, for the same reason why, you know, British ships equipped with turbines capable of doing 21 knots could keep up their top speed for longer than German ships equipped with turbines capable of 21 knots in World War One. So that that's one element of it, it's the quality of the fuel another element of it is the actual speeds because when we talk about you know a warship having to drop off after a while that's when they're running at pretty much their maximum rated power or maybe slightly over it to reach their absolute top speed whereas the liners although they were relatively quick didn't run absolutely flat out across the entire run and therefore because they're they're not running completely at top speed they don't necessarily need to have either all of their boilers online or all of their boilers up to full pressure which means if something goes wrong and one of them has to go down for something then they can you know compensate from others so if you look at say titanic her maximum rated speed is 23 knots but her cruising speed, i.e. the speed she would try and maintain across the Atlantic, is 21 knots. And similarly, if you look at, say, a battleship whose top speed is 21 knots, if you then ask that battleship to move around at 19 knots, you'll find the ship can keep going a lot longer at that speed, both in terms of how much fuel they've got and in terms of stress on the machinery, than if they're running at the 21. Another thing is if you look at the maximum attainable speeds by large ships, Generally speaking, not entirely, but generally speaking, the liners tend to lag a little bit behind the maximum attainable speed of contemporary warships. So using Titanic as an example, she's laid down in 1909, launched in 1911, and goes out in 1912. Well, there's another ship that's laid down in 1909 and is commissioned in 1912, and that's the battlecruiser HMS Lion. Now, Lion is, of course, a little bit smaller than Titanic, but whereas Titanic, as we mentioned earlier, is cruises at 21 knots with a maximum speed of 23, Lion has a maximum speed of about 28 knots. So, you know, the, the warships are pushing the edge of what's possible somewhat more so than the liners are. And this holds true as you go forward in time. Uh, in the late 1920s, for example, uh, the liner Bremen manages to get up to 28 knots, but by the late 1920s battle cruisers have been powering over 33 knots for quite a while so to recap it's a combination of at least when they're coal powered better quality fuel the fact that when they're making their transatlantic runs they're aiming for sustained speeds that are actually a little bit below what they could do at maximum and if they were running at maximum they probably would have to drop off after a while and related to that because they're running at a little less than their maximum possible they have the ability to adjust to the loss of a boiler or two and still maintain a, the given power output required. Dave Collier asks, can you tell us a bit about the escape of the submarine ORP Orzel after the invasion of Poland? Well, it definitely will get its own Wednesday video at some point, and that'll hopefully include the correct pronunciation of the name because I'm taking a wild stab at it based on the phonetics as it would be in English. Nonetheless... So, at the time of the invasion of Poland, uh, Orzel was dispatched to 
lay off of Danzig with orders that basically any German ship that emerged, but particularly Schleswig-Holstein, should be torpedoed. Um, the harbour, of course, being a little bit too narrow and confined for the submarine to safely enter with hostile forces already present. Uh, but it came very rapidly apparent that that wasn't going to happen, so she started to withdraw. She came under attack by uh, German escort vessels, and although she sustained damage, she was able to get away completely. There's now a little bit of a problem, because where do you go? Your friendly ports have been occupied, you're in the Baltic. Bearing in mind at this point the German-Soviet, uh, the Molotov-Ribbentrop Pact, is still in effect, so you can't go to Russia. You're basically down to either Sweden or the Baltic states, Latvia, Lithuania, and Estonia. So they decide, well, let's go for Estonia. It's relatively nearby, apart from anything else. So they do so, but uh, the same problems that they that uh, Graf Bay would have at Montevideo come into play, which is that neutral ships are uh, in neutral ports, sorry, belligerent ships are only supposed to be there for up to a day, 24 hours. Now, as with the Graf Spee incident, you could argue that you were badly damaged and you needed more time and they could agree an extension, but that would only be a relatively short extension. But poor old Estonia was, at this point, you know, looking at, well, there's Germany, there's German-occupied Poland, and there's the Soviet Union, and they're all on the same side, and Estonia's now looking very surrounded and very small, so when the Germans say, well, actually, we think you should really be very strict about this 24-hour thing, um, it would be a real shame if something were to happen to you. Otherwise, shockingly, the Estonians decided, well, at the end of 24 hours, we are going to inter the submarine. Um, so they do that, they take the crew off, they start to demilitarize her, they start taking out her weaponry, they take away all her maps, etc. Uh, basically making it, in theory, impossible for her to go anywhere. But uh, the crew decide that they're not going to have any of this, so after a few days in captivity, they decide to basically stage a breakout. They relatively easily overcome the guards. Um, get aboard the sub, get the sub running, um, and cast off. Now, as she's casting off, people realise, hey, that's not supposed to be happening, so she comes under fire, um, running se semi-submerged, because, of course, you want to try and duck as much incoming fire as possible, but you're also in a harbour, <laughs> so there's not a lot of depth to it. Uh, she is hit by some small arms fire, then runs aground, but then they realise, aha, but if we blow the ballast tanks, we can go over this thing. So they emerge a little bit more, get hit by some artillery fire for their trouble. Um, but at this point, the fact that you know submarines of this period have a pressure hole that's fairly deep inside the outer casing helps. So the pressure hole integrity is generally still fine. And they manage to make it out of Estonian waters. They then have another problem. Where do you go? A number of other Polish submarines had gone to Sweden, but Sweden had interned them. So, you know, they didn't particularly fancy this. They did rather like the idea of getting some revenge on Nazi Germany. And as they're motoring along, basically following the coast, because, as I said, all their maps and navigation aids have been removed, they hear that one of their sister submarines, or half-sisters, the Vilk, a.k.a. Wolf, has managed to make it to Britain and has been welcomed with open arms. So like, aha, we shall go to Britain. Navigation-wise, this obviously would be a little bit of a problem, but they do manage to make it out into the North Sea and then head vaguely west. Um, of course, with all of their navigation stuff destroyed, uh, or the navigation equipment removed, and their wireless communication system destroyed by the artillery and ma machine gun attacks they come under leaving Estonia, they have no way of telling anybody who they are, and so everybody in the North Sea decides to have a pop at them. But fortunately, a combination of the skill of her crew and the fact that ASW tactics at the very beginning of World War II weren't massively great meant that she survived. Eventually found her way to the east coast of Scotland and then realised, well, you know, an unknown submarine attempting to enter a British harbour probably won't get the world's most welcome reception. And so they decide to stay submerged while they make some emergency repairs to their wireless transmitter, pop up, and are like, um, 
hi guys also fortunately someone on board spoke english so I'm like hello um we are the orzel we would like to come and uh, help shoot nazis please at which point the royal navy's like fantastic idea we shall send someone out to bring you in and uh they sent a destroyer out and they're like huh we thought you were dead um <laughs> which seems to be a commonly recurring theme in the early part of the war uh, with marblehead and uh Ark Royal and uh, so forth, but having established that they were not in fact uh, wraiths, they managed to bring the sub in, and then she was repaired and put back to work in, uh, well, doing what they wanted to do, blowing up Nazi shipping. Unfortunately, this mission only lasted about half a year because she disappeared on patrol at some point between the end of May and beginning of June 1940, but nonetheless, it was a remarkable achievement that she got out in the first place. Slam and Sam asks, In the film The Hunt for the Red October, Ramius asks Ryan what books he wrote. Ryan answers he wrote a book on Admiral Halsey called The Fighting Sailor about naval combat tactics, and in response, Ramius says that Ryan's conclusions were all wrong and that Halsey acted stupidly. What is Ramius likely referring to, and do you agree with his assessment? Given that it's described as a book about naval combat tactics it's possible that they could be describing the two typhoons because there is a certain amount of tactics involved as i covered in the video on typhoon cobra the fact that halsey really wanted to get back to bombing the philippines but that seems less likely to me given the context of the brief discussion that's had in the film i have a feeling that it's probably more about the Battle of Leyte Gulf and the fact that Halsey went off charging after Azawa and left uh, Centre Force to come through and obviously you get the Battle of Samar. And in that case, yeah, I can see there being a bit of a argument <laughs> there because, well, it's remained a fairly controversial decision. Various historians have different positions on it. Um, as you know, I'm somewhat more on the negative side of interpreting Halsey's actions in that particular battle. Um, and uh, yeah, so at that point, I would be, I guess, on Ramius's side of saying that Halsey acted stupidly. Now, as I've mentioned in other dry docks, I don't necessarily think that Halsey had to stay with his entire fleet to deal with centre force. And, you know, yeah, Azawa's force was a legitimate target. But I think he dropped the ball on a couple of occasions, firstly, by not leaving Task Force 34 there in the first place. And secondly, when he was getting repeated communication from Admiral Lee asking, you know, can I go back because I think something bad is going to happen? Um, that was the second big mistake. And by ignoring both of those, he ended up with the situation you actually ended up with. So, yeah, I think that's probably what Ramus is talking to talking about. And I would probably agree with that assessment switch 374 asks during the early part of world war ii surface raiders were a german thing and battleships were used to escort convoys especially after the soviet union was in the war and arctic convoys were routine the arctic convoys could be spotted from the air why did the german navy not send out submarines to attack the battleships whilst surface raiders such as scharnhorst or Tirpitz were on their way so that the convoy defenses would be depleted of battleship protection and were any Allied battleships attacked and or damaged by U-boats during convoy escort duty? As far as I am aware, no Allied battleships were torpedoed by U-boats. Um, definitely not sunk and 99% uh, certain not damaged during Arctic convoy escort duty. The main reason why they weren't able to do as you suggest and use the subs to strip away the battleships is that Arctic convoy escort duty was a little bit different to escort duty as done in the Atlantic. In the Atlantic, the risk was German surface raiders directly attacking the convoys, so the battleships, the older ones that were assigned to it, tend to sail with the convoy escort, so they're all part of the same thing. Whereas when you're looking at the Arctic convoys, the convoy itself, with its lighter escorts, basically the anti-sub and anti-air escorts, sailed as a unit, so you know, recon could spot those. The heavy covering forces, however, which would be a mixture of cruisers, battleships, aircraft carrier or two, and an extensive destroyer screen, would sail separately, and they would hang a little bit further to the west and usually a little bit further to the north as well, 
in a separate formation that was then free to manoeuvre at the speed and course of its own choosing. And the, then if intelligence or recon got word of an incoming attack, they would then move to intercept the German surface radar away from the convoy rather than try, have a, try and have a running gunfight in the middle of the convoy. And that made the battleship escort force an incredibly difficult proposition for U-boats to attack, in large part because of their speed of manoeuvre and also because they were just further away and therefore much harder to actually find and for any recon aircraft to actually survive long enough to report back. And ultimately, what was the objective? Well, it was to stop Allied supplies from reaching the Soviet Union. And if a U-boat could take out two or three or four merchant ships in the convoy, then that would stop several tens of thousands of tons of supplies reaching the Soviet Union trying to fight your way through an active anti-submarine picket line on a fast-moving target and probably getting sunk for your troubles doesn't aid in that. And even if you somehow manage to get through and get torpedoes into a battleship or two, one, there's no guarantee that those battleships will go down because the ones that are used on the Arctic Convoy Escort tend to be the modern fast battleships. So landing a torpedo hit or two is not necessarily a guarantee that it's going to be sunk. Plus, as I said, the battleships tend to move in pairs, so there's still the other one. And it's going to cost you U-boats, and you that is all still predicated on the surface raiders then actually getting in to stop the convoy, which is not necessarily guaranteed because the convoy might scatter. And as I said already, you know, there's usually a carrier and another battleship there. You'd have to expend huge amounts of U-boat resources to managed to cripple or sink two carriers uh, sorry two battleships and an aircraft carrier through the screen before the screen deals with you it just wasn't a practical proposition as opposed to throwing those u-boats at the convoy itself dr dm platt asks why do steamships need to blow off extra steam such as the merchant ship which ignited the battle of jutland how often and under what circumstances does this need to be done do warships need to do this the main reason that this needs to be done is due to excess pressure. So obviously, when your boilers are going at a certain rate, they're producing a certain amount of energy, which is then transmitted into the water, which then turns into steam, which goes up to a certain pressure, which is then used to drive the engines. However, if you find yourself in need to slow down rather rapidly for whatever reason, you end up in a situation where you only need a little bit of that power, but the fires in the boiler and the heat transmitted from the boiler into the water aren't going to necessarily slow down at, um, and diminish at the same rate as your speed is going to diminish, which will then mean you have something of a problem of a buildup of energy, and the best way of getting rid of that buildup of energy is to just release the steam, release the pressure. As so you can see here, a, a US ship doing this in the interwar period. So that's one way of doing things. So yeah, if you need to make a, a sudden or dramatic drop in speed, or perhaps your engineers have slightly overdone the boilers, then you need to blow off steam. Um, now, this can also occur if even if you're traveling at a fairly regular speed, because if you'll remember with things like Carpathia and so forth, on a lot of steam turbine ships, various other ancillary systems are powered by steam so the total amount of boiler pressure and steam you need to build up incorporates your propulsion as a major part of it but you're also feeding other parts of that um, other elements of that steam pressure into other systems to keep them running and as with you know most uh, large energy using objects whether they be cities or ships the amount of power that's demanded varies through the day so if you're producing a fairly regular amount of energy then uh, you have to produce it to keep the ship running at all times so if you are say producing the amount of energy that's required for keeping the ship running whilst all of the galleys are going and you know all the and lighting etc various systems are running and then everyone's finished having their dinner and everything's kind of quiet, maybe early evening, then all of a sudden you're going to have a slight build-up of pressure because you're producing a little bit too much energy, at which point it's easier just to blow off a little bit of steam 
and keep going at a steady pace. So this is why when you look in logbooks of liners and merchant ships, very often you'll just see entries which indicate we're blowing off steam occasionally as needed pretty much every day. Um, the other reason you might do it is a little bit less likely on average, but it's for what they call a boiler blowdown. So you will eventually get impurities building up in the water that's in the boilers that can have some rather nasty corrosive effects. So one of the ways to get rid of that is either a surface or bottom blowdown. Um, gives you some idea where in the water column you're, you're doing the operation. And that involves basically using releasing some of the pressure in order to get the heated water that's got the impurities built up in it out. Now, how that's disposed of can be done in a number of ways and varies depending on the size of ship the type of ship the era etc as per usual however um, whilst sometimes and indeed quite often those products are just ejected out of the ship as hot water um, in some exchange systems the uh, impure water that's got all the nasty stuff that you want to get rid of is allowed to just flash away into steam which can then be ejected um, through the funnels but that's that's a somewhat rarer instance than the more conventional way of blowing off steam just to reduce pressure in the boilers well that's part one done on to part two